um, welcome to the um, to our work session today, which is a meeting of the Planning Commission of Santa, City of Santa Barbara for July 23rd, 2009. And um, uh, I would like to open with public comment, not on this issue, on any other issue, not on the agenda today. Roll call. Oh, I'm sorry. We're all here. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Ma Madam Secretary, roll call, please. All right. Thank Commissioner, you. Commissioner Bartlett. Here. Commissioner Jacobs. Not here. Commissioner Justice. Here. Commissioner Lodge. Here. Commissioner White. Here. Commissioner Thompson. Here. Chair Larson. Here. Thank you. Any um, additions, corrections? Yes, uh, yes, Madam Chair. We do have, uh, in terms of preliminary items, uh, continuance for item 5, 226-232 Eucalyptus Hill Road. Uh, that will be continued to, uh, the, uh, to the August 20th. August 20th meeting. Thank you. Oh, then that's the only... That's it? Yeah, that's the only other okay, change we have. Okay, announcements and appeals. We have a cancellation of a meeting, I believe. Correct. Well, the meeting is August 13th, if I'm correct. And that meeting, August 13th, 2009, will be canceled. Thank you. Um, now, the public comment, two minutes from anybody who would like to speak on any item, the weather, anything that's not on our agenda today. Seeing no one come forward, I'll close the public comment, and we'll get to the matter at hand. And uh, today we have scheduled a special work session. It's not a workshop, it's a work session. There's a difference. This is where we work. And, and so, and, and to do this, we've, uh, we do have a plan. And the plan is that um, we are going to have a staff presentation. Uh, then we're going to have a discussion of the MOTA. And then we will do our public comment. So uh, we'll go in that order, and you'll get plenty of grist for your comment. <coughs> so that being the case, I will turn this over to John Ledbetter for the staff presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as you mentioned, the, the agenda today um, is going to focus on the MOTA, but before we get to the MOTA, we'll talk about density and affordability, which are the really the two key driving issues of late uh, that um, affect the MOTA and how that will get implemented. And so the key uh, components of that discussion, I'll touch very uh, briefly on the variable density changes that are proposed and compare them with our existing variable density uh, standards. Talk a little bit about the development feasibility study, try not to get into too much detail on that. Touch on a few of the key issues that were raised during the, the workshops last month. And then um, talk a little bit further about the considerations of the MOTA related to density and housing affordability. And then look to um, work on the map, the mode map, and some direction from the, um, the Planning Commission. The second part of the meeting will be focused on the land use map itself, the overall map, and five focus areas that we'll look at in more detail. And again, looking for uh, commission direction on uh, how we should move forward with that. Um, the existing variable densities today, the standards, are based on numbers of units. And uh, over the last 10 or 15 years, one of the unintended consequences really has been the development of these larger, more expensive units, um, big structures that in some cases uh, have caused some consternation by parts of the community on just the sheer size of them, such as some of those on Chapala. And uh, they have a lot of par lots of parking. That's another characteristic of them. 
the direction that we got from the Plan Santa Barbara po policy is to look at encouraging how can we encourage smaller units. And what that translates to is a smaller unit means sm smaller, more compact buildings, uh, greater levels of affordability, less parking, more open space, and uh, view preserving of the views. So that was the direction we were given. That was the task that we were set out here to, to uh, pursue. Um, now, again, the, in comparing uh, the uh, variable density that's proposed through Plan Santa Barbara changes, essentially the main change is substituting unit size for bedrooms. With, and there is a minor increase in the amount of, of density. So if you look at these two tables, and I promise these will be the only two tables I'll show you, <laughs> um, you can see what the existing standards are and the Plan Santa Barbara standards. On the left-hand side, unit type is you know, the type of number of bedrooms that really dictates what kind of densities you get. And um, you see here one and two bedrooms. You know, with a, a lot, say you had a lot of 1840 size, you'd get one bedroom. Um, and it was all one bedrooms, so you'd get 24 units per acre. And the inclusion area requirement is, is 15%. And then Plan Santa Barbara, on, by contrast, instead of looking at the number of bedrooms to determine the unit size, I mean to determine the density, you're looking at what the unit size is. So in other words, Around, this, around these sizes in here, somewhere between 700 and 1,000, maybe 1,300, um, those are where with a target area for the most we're anticipating, the average of one to two bedrooms. And again, you know, I, I, that's really key here, is that's the focus with, that we want you to, to keep in mind as we go through this, uh, this discussion, that uh, the uh, the di main difference is you're looking, shifting from bedrooms that have resulted in these large studio one bedrooms um, uh, to maximize the density and uh, that have been uh, fitted with uh, luxury type finishes in order to get the highest return versus the Plan Santa Barbara, which is looking at reducing the unit size so that you can uh, achieve more affordability and a smaller building, a more compact building. Um, and again, the, and then the average sizes is, is around the 20, between 20 and 25 units per acre. You don't see a real huge increase in the amount of density here between uh, these, what's existing and what's being proposed. So why was the feasibility study undertaken? To assess the economic feasibility of the variable density changes in Santa Barbara that would encourage the market to produce smaller, more affordable units and more compact buildings. So the four scenarios are the existing variable, uh, which uh, is based on number of bedrooms, the planned Santa Barbara proposal of variable density based on unit size, and then a third scenario looking at an increased number of units, and then finally scenario four that looks at maximizing the number of units uh, by income target. So that what that means is it would be um, uh, restricted units uh, as well as some standard standard size units. And I'll get into that in a second. Assumptions, these are just a few of the key assumptions. You're look, they looked at one acre sites, three to four story buildings maximum, excuse me, a 15% profit. And um, all the all the scenarios include, had inclusionary units and with the goal, ma the goal of maximizing affordable units. So what did the study tell us? The, the key results of the study were that the, for the plant Santa Barbara changes to variable density, the market will not build smaller units at this proposed density, at, where, where there's a very small shift, a very minor increase in density. But it will reduce the overall building size. So that's kind of the good news, bad news. W scenario four, on the other hand, uh, that with a maximum unit mix at 60, what they found was you needed a maximum unit mix of 60 dwelling units per acre in order for it to pencil, as the developers say. Uh, and what that would result with would be 60% of the units would be standard units, not luxury units, but standard units, and 40% of them would be affordable, restricted, and perpetuity type units. So you're getting a 40-60 combo there. Um, and then the other... Uh, the other finding that we found interesting was building heights and 
what you can put into the building envelopes. And so for a 40-foot building, uh, it seems very likely that you could put a three-story single use with a slope roof. Shouldn't be a problem. But where they found it would be unlikely would be to try and get four stories into a 40-foot building. And even with a flat roof, it would be um, a stretch. Uh, finally, for a larger building at 45 to 52, you could get both four stories and either a single or a mixed use with a sloped roof. And then lastly, uh, what we found interesting was the parking. That Plan Santa Barbara had proposed that um, we have a maximum parking standard of one unit, uh, and then anything beyond that would be sold separately from the unit. So. Uh, the lingo or the jargon they use is it's unbundled from the price of the of the unit itself. Now what the economic study told us was that well if you're going to have any kind of luxury units or even standard units they're going the market is going to demand two spaces and so you, you can get one space or maybe even no spaces for an affordable unit but if you're going the, the developers are going to demand two in order to make it pencil they're going to really want two units so that's how they came up with in all their uh, assumptions with an average of 1.5 spaces per unit. So what did the workshop, what were some of the issues that came up last month? Well, as you probably not surprised, in terms of density, there was the, uh, those that stood up and said, you know, 60 dwelling units, too much, overbuilding, we don't want that level of density in our town, uh, versus those that said, hey, we really need the affordability of this higher density, we want to see, you know, density on uh, transit lines, and you know, it was the polemic that we've been struggling with for the throughout this whole process. Um, and then another another issue issue was design, and what would 60 units uh, an acre look like? And we got asked that a couple of times, and you know, giving the response of, well, we do have some a number of units that are publicly subsidized at 60 and above. Uh, not too many market ones we see it like that, at least that have been built recently. Um, unit size, again, you got some varying opinions there. Well, who are, you, who are these being built for? Is there really a market demand for a 850 to 900 foot square uh, foot unit? And the response from the economist was, yeah, that, that there is definitely, a, they did do market research and there is a demand for one to two, a strong demand for one to two bedrooms of this more moderate size unit. And that um, the discussion really led to a range of housing types and that, that the, the community really needs a range of housing types from single room occupancy on the one hand to, um, you know, higher density apartments and condominiums on the other with everything in between including single family, uh, duplexes, et cetera. And interestingly, we have seen um, a couple of projects come in late, of late, one in particular with 850 square foot units. Um, and then lastly, the other interesting uh, issue that was raised was that about ceiling heights, which relates indirectly to building heights in that um, there's some uh, difference of opinion as to what is really necessary uh, to, to uh, well, what is necessary. So if you look at absolutely what is necessary, the standard over the, over the years has been uh, eight-foot ceilings. And, and all, you look at all the affordable units, they pretty much hold them at eight foot. But anything that's come out more recently is in a market, the market really is leaning more now towards nine and ten-foot ceilings. Ten-foot definitely for the luxury, um, the luxury units. And I think most people would more or less agree with that characterization. And then finally, the, the economic study pointed that pretty standard now for um, uh, commercial retail is 15 feet ceiling heights on the ground floor. So with that in mind, with those, um, you know, these sort of findings in mind, both uh, from the economic study and what we some of the, the reaction that we got from the community, the questions that I'd, I'd like to pose at this point, and then I'm going to go into a little bit more um, discussion here about the moda itself, and then we'll come back to these questions. But really, do we want to continue to look at changes to the variable density standards to reduce the unit sizes and the building envelopes in the moda, even though the, um, it doesn't pencil in terms of the market affordability? So that's the first question. The second question is, uh, and part of this, is if the goal of the MODA is to, uh, um, uh, to 
redirect our future growth potential uh, into the areas that are transit rich and that have good strong walking and uh, biking accessibility then in order to balance these densities the idea would be that we would establish the R3 and R4 zones at 18 dwelling units per acre and not um, no longer have variable densities there and then finally the big question is you know are market driven affordable units desired at the required density at the 60 units of, uh, an acre and if so where do we want to see that and how how would we deliver that so you know in the moda where exactly in the moda would we have this as an overlay uh, what relationship would that have with the adaptive management program and you know what kind of standards that kind of thing so just keep those kind of questions in mind and as I just finished up the presentation here so just to remind the Commission and the public what uh, our policy objectives were in establishing this mobility oriented development area the moda it really is to create an area where we live we work we play and we move easily um, uh, uh, through it without necessarily driving the car uh, and in doing that we paying attention to the size bulk scale and height of the buildings and uh, with due respect to our historic and cultural resources and then finally in a kind of a corollary here is this is something again that we've heard through the excuse me <clears throat> through the plan Santa Barbara process is that you know the established neighborhoods need to be protect protected what we did not hear was a mandate to go out and put the density out into the neighborhoods where you don't have good transit you can't walk to the stores you can't walk or bike and you have to deal with the impacts of uh, parking in the neighborhood and added congestion so it's quite that that is really I think uh, fundamental to the mode of policy it's the other corollary that if you're concentrating you know on a more sustainable approach where the future uh, housing is going to be you know on these transit lines and where the commercial you have good access to grocery stores and drug stores and that kind of thing then the corollary is well you don't want to be spreading out the density out where people are, are driving their cars and so just again just kind of keep that in mind as we go through this discussion and then in terms of future growth uh, you know the next increment of growth is pretty small over the next 20 years 2800 units is what the plan Santa Barbara is is projecting and what we're looking to do is target those in the moda and and build as many of those as affordable as possible and again I think I mentioned already the whole concept of rebalancing future growth uh, between um, you know shifting it from the multifamily areas into the moda that, that's the concept really of making it work so that you don't have a lot of overall increase in the development potential in the city Motor criteria. Somebody asked me that the other day. They said, "Well, geez, what, what's the criteria you're using to establish the moda and where it goes?" And it's it really is. It's a quarter mile proximity, which is is a pretty standard for an easy walk to transit, so you can find transit from where you live. Easy biking and walking to you know open space, commercial, um, recreation, and then a quarter mile to uh, to your retail. And then uh, affordability sites, uh, sites where we do have um, uh, opportunities to build affordable housing. And then lastly here, these are some opportunities and concerns that, you know, should we get to the discussion of where we want to see higher densities in the MODA and in some of these areas that we've highlighted and targeted uh, for neighborhood centers. Um, they differ somewhat and at first we as staff had uh, you know designated a, a few of these that we thought were key like so for example La Cumbre Plaza it seems like a no-brainer you know it's a huge opportunity site it's it's got the grocery store it's got uh, Sansom it's got excellent transit the 6 and the 11 it's got freeway access if you need that and it seems like you know again a, a no-brainer to to redevelop that site with higher densities but when you start looking at some of these other ones um, 
there become more pros and cons. You know, how much uh, transit is actually serving the Milpas area, uh, and how much pedestrian infrastructure do we really have? Hmm. Or, uh, for example, the downtown core, where we have our best transit and our best walkability, the most commercial, the most uses. But, you know, there's a lot of, of um, reservation, consternation about you know, what we've seen, uh, the projects we've seen down in Chapala, the fact that this is right in the heart of EPV. So, again, you know, this is, these are the kind of things that we want you as a commission to grapple with. And we'll help, when Rob gets here shortly, help walk you through some of these and talk about, you know, what are the pros and cons in each one of these neighborhood centers. And, um, and then, you know, other, other issues are uh, De La Vina is a, is a one-way street. Um, and anyway, I'll let Rob touch on these transportation issues, which he can articulate better than I. Um, the, the proximity to open space, and I mentioned EPV. So that, that's the map that we have here. But before we get to that discussion, you know, I think we should have this. The, the commission really needs to kind of grapple with this, and we would we'd like some feedback on that. And um, and then hopefully we'll end up here on number three and we can talk a little bit in a little bit more detail and uh, try and come to a, um, a consensus uh, on how we should move forward on, on this portion. So with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to back to the chair to sort of lead this discussion here. Thank you, John. Uh, for purposes of this discussion, I want to ask you, John, are, uh, are we uh, locking, are we free, having this discussion free of of RENA numbers and uh, 375, sort of just so that we can not be dominated by numbers, or or is this overriding everything? Um, yeah, I would prefer that, that we have more of an open discussion about that, but I mean, if pe people feel strongly about that, if any of the commissioners feel like that's a really strong point, and uh, you know, that needs to be factored in and considered, you know, which obviously it does. Um, then you know that needs to be brought out. So I, I don't think that anything we want to take anything off the table necessarily. But um, so the answer would be no. That's not taken off the table. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Because it does it does color our discussion somewhat, mm -hmm. a lot actually. So, all right. With that in mind, um, uh, we have this map here, and John has, or we can use a uh, a pointer for for the map and. Uh, we have these directions to follow up here, so I would be looking for, uh, would, you, would you like time to think a little bit, or would you uh, prefer just to start out? Bruce Bartlett. Ma I, Madam Chair, I would hope that we could have more sort of roundtable well, discussion rather than just well, everybody do your yeah. speech and then that well, is the a workshop was, idea. Yeah, so. the intention is John will, will either move or we come around him. I can move back a bit and we can cluster around the map and, and uh, it's big enough we can talk and there's a pointer and all the good stuff. Right. To see the map. Uh, oh, public, Charmaine, public, welcome. Public oh, comment? Excuse public me? Comment. Oh, I'm, public comment is coming. After this discussion? Yes. Uh, public comment actually was, we were going to discuss the MODA and the changes to variable density, these things up here, and then I would open public comment following the discussion. If you would prefer otherwise, I'm happy to do that. Well, I imagine that, I imagine, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, I imagine that a lot of people here have things that they want to say about it to affect our okay. discussion. All right. And I could certainly, Madam Chair, entertain questions first if uh, the Commission just had a few questions before you want to open it up to public comment. Yeah, okay. certainly open to that. Bruce. Since I had my mic on, I'll, I'll go with my questions. The packet that we were given uh, on page six, you kind of outlined the Planning Commission direction and where you wanted feedback. And the copies that we have are different than what you put on the screen, uh, especially number one where it said, should changes to the variable density standards be pursued to regulate unit sizes? And what you had on the screen also added and building envelopes. And what I realized in going through and doing my spreadsheet homework last night, uh, 
if I look at the the material that the consultant put together on page 10, and you had that on the screen, that was the two short charts of the existing variable density versus the proposed. Mm -hmm. it, you may want to put that up, but I know what we've been reviewing in our last few years here at Planning Commission was going by the sort of 0.85 FAR or 85 percent of the variable density as we review projects, and that was for the the residential component of mixed-use projects, and when you actually take the chart of what you're proposing in Plan Santa Barbara, you've cut that nearly in half. It ranges from a 0.36 FAR under the new mm -hmm. proposal to, I think, a 0.59 at the highest. So, not only are we, you know, reducing unit sizes, the box that we're putting the units in has drastically shrunk. I mean, it really, it's a, it's a drastic loss of capacity in terms of where you can put residential. I didn't realize that the goal was to shrink the box in half. I knew we were trying to put smaller units in the box, but this is a drastic shift in my mind's eye. So um, I just wanted to ask where the shrinking the envelope came from because it certainly wasn't in our packet. Yes, that's a, Madam Chair, that's a, that's a great question. I'm glad you brought that up, um, Commissioner uh, Bartlett. Uh, uh, that is fundamental to what we're trying to achieve in Plan Santa Barbara. It's to increase the density, but reduce the envelope of the building side so you do achieve those um, other goals that the community is looking for, the community character goals of uh, more open space, view preservation, that sort of thing. And you do that in tandem with reducing the parking requirements. And uh, that's how you can reduce the by reducing the parking requirements and the unit size, that's how you can bring the building envelope down. And given the um, yeah, given the amount of concern in the community about the community character and, and the size of buildings, this is uh, this is how we're trying to balance and achieve these two competing goals. And it gets right to the heart of it. You're right. It gets right to the heart of the issue. Okay. I just want everybody to realize what a drastic shrink it was in the size of the box, not just the units. So, thanks. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Justice. Uh, thank you. Uh, John, I've, I, I've got a question uh, on the summary of development scenarios tested table, uh, which is on page 13. It kind of summarizes how the report mm -hmm. looked at various things. <clears throat> and I know we have another scenario that's being proposed by uh, one of the gentlemen from the public. But those uh, four area ratios uh, for residential, is it, is it correct to assume that the, the study really looked primarily at, at residential and not at mixed use? And that if you add commercial or office or non-residential into uh, this table, we get different um, floor area ratios because these are, appear to be just limited to uh, to the residential piece. And, and so I, I want to make sure I understand uh, all of the uh, conclusions of this document in terms of whether it's strictly driven by residential, uh -huh. three or four story various unit densities, or does that somehow uh, include or Mm -hmm. uh, reflect mixed use as well, e also as a contributor to economic feasibility and the mm -hmm. performance that were that were run on these things, because that mm -hmm. that was a huge deal uh, for the public at the workshops, and, mm -hmm. and it is for us as well. Yeah, no, that great question. Uh, you're right. This table 11.5 does not reflect that. However, uh, that was definitely part of the study, and the findings they they uh, touched on those. Two, two of the findings relate directly to that. The first one is that uh, commercial retail essentially pays for itself in these kind of developments. That was their first finding. And then the second finding was related to building heights. And, uh, you know, they f felt that, you know, you, this is a kind of a mix and match approach here. And what you see in this table is all focused on residential. But when you look at the building heights and part of the, um, Part of that discussion relates to ceiling heights. Their conclusion was, you know, for retail, you needed to have 15 feet on the bottom. So if you want to have retail and you want to have a mixed-use project of three, a three-story mixed-use project, it's going to push you over 40 feet for sure. 
So that was their conclusion. And so just in summary, it's for economics, it, it, it pays for itself. And then in terms of building envelope, it does have implications because the market demands you know, a higher ceiling height for those retail okay. structures. So, so, if I, uh, so I'm still not clear that um, if we leave the variable density standards as they sit now, these residential numbers get overlaid on top of uh, commercial development potential in the non-residential zones, in commercial and CO and CP zones. That'd be cr I'm, I'm trying to get the, the full picture in terms of what happens in the volume uh -huh. on a given acre of property. Yeah. Uh, another good question I think that it helps illuminate for the community as well because you know, I think it is useful to think of it as the envelope, the building envelope. And what can you put into this building envelope? Well, you're constrained by, the first thing that constrains it is the height of the right. building, right? So if we're looking at, you know, a 40-foot height limit or a 45-foot height limit or the current 60-foot height limit, that's really what's going to um, control how many floors of what types of use you're going to get into it. But you're correct that, you know, uh, it's really... Um, uh, it's really a, a, a decision that an independent decision that's made by the developer as to what mix of units they're going to want and what potential they want to exercise, and that there is a, a um, there is a policy in Plan Santa Barbara that talks to the development potential of maximizing your your commercial and maximizing your residential, and and some people feel like that's sort of double dipping, if you will, but. Um, so, so that's something that needs to be discussed further, uh, and but it, that that aspect wasn't really uh, covered in, in the economic feasibility. Yeah. Huh? Thank you, Mr. Justice. Thank you, Mr. Ledbetter. Um, Miss <laughs> Bendy, go ahead. <laughs> Hello. I, I want to say something so that I can get this off my mind. Anybody who wants to do public comment, so I can focus and not forget to say this, fill out a green slip, please, if you intend to do public comment. And if you give them to Julie, thank you, she'll get them to me and I'll put them in the stack. That being said, I'll be able to pay better attention without raking my eyes over the audience going, I wonder who hasn't put up a green slip yet. If you see a neighbor come in and sit next to you, please tell them on my behalf. Thank you. All right. Mr. White. Well, first of all, uh, Rob's arrived. Was there was there? A, were you going to make a presentation, Rob, as part of the the package? No, you're just here to. I, I would like, yeah, and I would like when we get to the discussion of the the moda and looking at some of these uh, neighborhood center areas. That's really where I want Rob to chime in and talk about the opportunities, constraints of transit and and uh, other forms of mobility. So, and are we asking questions about the moda now? Absolutely. Okay. Um, the uh, one, mo one moment. Uh, Mo Mobility-oriented development area. area. Um, that was Mr. Kellum DeForest. Yes. Um, so on, on the on the moda, um, the I'd appreciate hearing a little feedback about a, a couple of. Conundra. Number one is City College. I mean, I'm looking, I'm trying to see how are we uh, providing services? We have these centers of demand uh, today, and the ones that came to mind are the, are the various schools and the City College, and of course, and then Harbor Breakwater as examples. How are those not, uh, how is it? How did you come to the conclusion to exclude those from a moda, and how would they receive transportation? Well, first of all, Planning Commission members, uh, sorry I was late. I was in Bielton on a Measure A strategic meeting, which is very hot and heavy for all of us, too. Um, I just want to just make sure I'm understanding where exactly we are. I'm assuming you've asked the three questions to the Planning Commission at this point in the time so really when in, in getting into the mode of discussion about how we change things really relates to how you answer those questions so in the flow of the conversation it's probably better to at least to have the question about the the uh, uh, driving the do we, are we still on board with going for the more the market driven affordable units 
at the densities that are required. And then depending on how you answer that question, really, we can talk about how we change the moda. But in answer directly to your question, I think that we need to, we can't think of the moda is if it's not in the moda, we're not supplying transit to it, or we don't think it's a, a nodal center. Uh, uh, SPCC and other places outside of the city that are nodes will always remain those and will still service those. The, the moda is really about how does the land use mix relate to the transit and the walkability and the bikeability. And so you think of it in that way. It's got to really, the motor's really got to have all the ingredients to make it, um, to make it really work. It has to have the mix, the, the rich mix of residential retail. It's got to have the high connectivity with uh, walking and biking and, and the transit all together. That's what really makes it work. And then we could talk about the nuances of, you know, how fat or skinny it is. Uh, based on how you answer the questions about how, where where are we going to place the land development and and the housing in particular, does that answer your question or give you a better perspective? Um, it's it's it, it's I think of us as uh, developing a transportation system that we can afford uh, and that's serving the existing, uh, uh, serving the likely areas of need, and that then that becomes our moda somehow. And I'm picturing that there are areas where it's difficult to provide bus service, or where we may even be providing it now, but we just can know realistically in order to provide great service to another area or to, to, a, uh, to the areas of need, we may need to reshape the, the transit system. So I think of the MODA as a um, our transit network. And then from there, uh, add on the land, land uses that, uh, uh, and for example, Castillo, um, Casa de las Fuentes is not eligible, would not be eligible for the density that it has by, by this map. So I find I, I'm finding there's uh, contradictions, and I'm looking for ways to uh, bring those contradictions into into harmony. So that's why I'm asking these questions. Uh, I, I don't understand how City College and Casa de las Fuentes would be outside of of the moda, and so that's why I was asking these questions. I, I think the I think that's good. That gives me a lot of insight. I think it's really important to understand what the moda includes and what it defines. I think we may even, may even have a slide on that. But um, in the framework document, we specifically talk about the moda and what it includes. And um, I think it's uh, Commissioner Justice has his light on. Maybe he can help. No, no, I just uh, LG. You and he raised a question that okay. raised a question for me as well. Okay. So, so in in LG um, in LG uh, nine, we talk about the moda and what it includes, and I think it's important to really understand it. It's not just a transit service; it's got it's all the ingredients. It's where we're gonna it's where we have policy to in, in, intensify development, um, intensify transportation, uh, reduce parking. It's got all those ingredients with under the the banner moda so like for instance another thing that the community really said loud and clear in the planning commission too i think is that congestion levels uh cannot go up congestion is is a is a real important thing to the community well when you start putting moda on the other side of the freeway and you start saying well we're going to have more density on the other side of the freeway we're going to have we're going to concentrate development all the things that go with the moda those have ramifications for traffic. You know, they're, certainly they'll have alternative mode of aspects, but you'll also be increasing automobile travel. And since our impacted intersections are all along the freeway, our, our main ones, any more automobile travel to and from the downtown area from outside on the other side of the freeway means more congestion. So we have to balance the picture in what we say is a moda. Um, and I think that that's why you're seeing the moda tighten up and be on this side of the freeway 
doesn't mean you can't say, well, you know, SB, uh, SBCC is an important node and it needs to have a strong transit presence and, hey, we should put housing and encourage the, the them to overcome the state regulations that say they can't have housing on con It doesn't say we can't do all those things. It just means that uh, it's not defined as a part of the MODA. Is that is that clear? Um, I, I, I'm, I understand what you're saying. Uh, it's still, it still feels like a, a little bit of a contradiction to me, and uh, I'll see if I can bend my head around it. And the only thing I might add to that, if it helps at all, Bendy, is that you know, we did identify future potential modas, and you know, the the uh, the West Side is a natural. Santa Barbara City College is a natural. Uh, the Mesa is a natural. I mean, they have some of the basic characteristics that uh, would prove to be a successful uh, uh, moda area. But right now, they're not as well served with transit, and they don't have as likelihood of, of success as some of these other areas. And that's why, in the attempt to try and rebalance our future development potential residential over the next 20 years we're really trying to focus it on those areas where we feel will have the most success and that we can balance the amount of uh, development potential so that's why you've seen we've had three iterations that effectively have narrowed up the moda to really focus on these core areas where we think we can see the most success it's not to say that that you know the west West Side isn't potential, or Mesa, or uh, City College, or even uh, this area over on Las Positas was identified early on, and that's another potential site. But we're trying to be realistic about what we can accomplish over the next 20 years, so that this is a success. We want it. that's the bottom line: is we want this to be a success and effort. minimize congestion. Because remember, you all saw, and I, I, I probably didn't stream and 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 stand up and hand the table hard enough, but we saw the baseline model of 2030 already we all saw that and we saw our 13 intersections go to 29 impacted intersections remember so our so in order to get to uh, no increased congestion we have a long way to go and so any any additional development on this this side of the freeway we have to be really careful about because it'll go through impacted intersections if it indeed materializes this tra traffic and some of it will Commissioner Justice. Uh, uh, but, but don't we have uh, transport traffic thresholds in place? And with the living within our resources policies that we're putting forward and the EIR process that, that, that is used, uh, doesn't that uh, address that issue so that uh, the, the review process and the adaptive management process will take care of some of the concerns that that Rob, you voice in terms of south of the freeway, west of the freeway. It just seems like we got a we got a, uh, a train station south of the freeway and an under an undercrossing that doesn't relate to some of the same concerns that I think we all have as far as impacted freeway exchanges and and to to take that that area and and City College out of the. Um, the mode, I just, I scratch my head. It just, it doesn't compute with me. Yeah, we do, you know, the, the and I think you're referring to, and I, we've explained it, you know, it's how, it's, it's where the project comes to our desk first, and we just say, no, you can't do it because it's an impact. Right. And that works with the larger projects. But with the smaller projects, and if the zoning's in place, let's say, and it, it doesn't come to you, and it just going to ABR, that doesn't work. We don't, we don't, we don't, the project doesn't rise up to the level of um, where we can say no. It just fits in with the zoning. Or, or you have a smaller project that is maybe it's the three unit, you know, or four unit houses and they're all coming in a little bit at a time. We, we not, may not necessarily catch that into the no, in the no process because, because it's small enough so it's not sending a trip that we can follow to an impacted intersection. You, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. All right. Any other questions at the moment? Um, yes, Madam Chair. Ms. Lodge? It's beginning to sound as if this is all, everything that we're doing is driven by traffic congestion. Because, you know, you're saying, okay, this is out of the moda, because if we do increase density there, um, we'll have more more traffic congestion. And... And I'm, I'm beginning to wonder just how useful this moda is. 
um, to use that to decide where increased density is going to go, if we're going to have increased density, not that I'm right. Uh, or if we're moving it from one area to another. When I look at the zoning map and I see all the, that's the R3, where the, you know, where the, some of the, it's being proposed to take density from there to put in, to concentrate it in these certain areas. There's certain areas where the land is the most expensive, for starters, and it's only going to make it more expensive if you increase the density, which will make it more difficult to create the affordable housing. Um, they are all pretty much along transportation corridors. And so maybe you could explain to me how, what I'm missing here? Well, I, that is the point. The point is to focus it on the transportation corridors, and that, that really gets to the fundamental assumption of the utility and the purpose, the objective of the MODA. And it partly is congestion, but it's also, you know, livability. It's also a um, an attempt to build housing that's, uh, you know, more compact, uh, smaller, but, you know, it, it benefits from from transit and you know you're able to walk to the store you're able to ride your bike to the store or even to work uh, and so it's more it, it's much more than just simply congestion it, it's a it's a different type of, uh, of a lifestyle than somebody that lives on the Riviera and it's not for everybody and you know that's not the intention here but it is there is a market for that and there are um, there are a, a str a, a good portion of the community that, that would live in those units if they were affordable, and it just—it's a little bit—it's um, a new idea for for Santa Barbara. I'm not sure it's a good one. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> uh, I have, I have a question uh, relating to what uh, you said to Mr. White, which was regarding City College, where obviously there is a transit-rich environment already. Wouldn't that same be true for downtown then? I mean, we have it now designated as part of the MODA, but if, if it's understood that certain areas are already that, then maybe we don't need to designate that particular, like EPV, as part of the MODA, uh, since it's already existing there. And it's easy yeah. walkability, and it goes by definition, and, and it's, it's, it fills the bill, really. That part does. So to... Uh, I'm trying to. I'm trying to figure out how to protect EPV. Uh, well, and that gets right to the third question. So, you know, if, if we are interested in pursuing further uh, some type of a density overlay to have market build affordable units, then you know, which ones of these are more appropriate, and which are, what are the considerations we want it to, um, to to grapple with? And so, that's exactly the type of discussion we'd like to have. I think that's actually the heart of it is, uh, and I think you said it real succinctly when you said we have, commu we have, uh, what was it? How did you say it? Community, community goals, versus, and, and I wrote it down. Let's see. Do you remember what it was, anybody? Community goals versus, um, uh, oh, versus community character. You said that yourself at this meeting. Actually, you reversed it. You said community character versus community goals, and that struck right at what I feel is this huge conflict we're having because I don't think anybody says it out loud. I mean, I think, the, I think our generous and, and active public does, but I think we all sort of tap dance around it, but you stated it, and that's great to get the elephant well, in the middle of the room. If I said that, I misspoke, but I meant the conflicting goals, one of which is the community character versus affordability. And I think that's the sort of the classic polemic that we've been dealing with, is these are two, at times, that can be very conflicting between how do we maintain the community character and how do we promote affordability and everything that, that, that goes Which is defined as a community goal. Exactly. So they're so. both community goals, but at times, so we're really trying to walk that line of how do we achieve both those goals. I mean, that's that's really gets to the heart of it here. Ms. Jacobs. Um, as we go forward into public comment, I just want to make sure I have a good concept and that and to check in and make sure my idea of what the mobility-oriented development area is supposed to be um, 
because it's been called a new idea, it's kind of a new idea, but I don't see it as being that new. And let me explain what I mean. Now, when I was in school, the essay question is always compare and contrast to A and B, and you have to come up with all the ways that A is different from B. And we are in the habit of thinking that way, and somehow we're in the like, well, I don't like that because it's different from A. You know, and it's, so that's how I'm contrasting it. I don't see this as being so very different from the kind of planning that Santa Barbara has done in the past regarding our commercial square footage. And this is what I just want to check in and see. Am I way off in the hinterlands on this, or am I thinking of it in a, in a, a, a good, applicable, practical way? Um, this, often in the commission, we have projects that come forward that are mixed-use projects, and we have to grapple with the restrictions on commercial square footage and how that is doled out versus residential square footage. And in some ways, the residential square footage is a little bit sloppier than how the commercial square footage is handled because some years ago the city passed Measure E. And we said, here's the kind of square footage we want, here's where we want it, and here's the kind we don't want. And so the, uh, the city planning process is very much engaged in determining commercial square footage at that <coughs> level. But we haven't done that so well with residential square footage, in particular in our commercial districts where um, what used to be a commercial district is now mixed use. And this to me looks like handling some of our residential square footage with the same kind of care and precision that we've handled our commercial square footage saying here's the kind of square footage we want from our residential development, here's where we want it, and here's why. And in this case it has to do with um, kind of getting people to park once and walk, which is exactly what we did with the downtown parking district, and it worked great. So I don't think this is that different. It's applying something that people like and use in our commercial scenario to how we would like to plan our residential scenario, saying here's a chance to plan so that you can park your car and leave it and then go on foot, go on the bus, go on some other kind of transportation. And I think it will have the benefits for our neighborhoods the same way that the downtown neighborhood benefited from the parking district and making the sidewalks more beautiful, getting the, the trolley going so that people can get out of their car and walk. And to me, this doesn't feel that different. This feels like we're learning from the success of what we've done with our commercial property and we're applying it now to a more precise rendition of our residential property. To me, it makes a lot of sense as a continuity. I don't see it as a compare and contrast A and B thing at all. I see it as a, a progression and a continuity. So am I way off base? Oh, that's right. That yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So I because when I listen to public comment, I know there's a lot of polarity. You know, we didn't do it this way before, so we don't want to do it that way now, A, B. I see this as a continuum and that's what I'm listening for, is for how does this um, continue the good planning that the city has done into the future. Okay. No, Chair. Thank you. No, uh, Ms. Lodge? Um, the parking districts uh, were formed solely because business people were having to compete with Lacumber Plaza. So it didn't, you know, it, it may, the result may have been flow into this, but it certainly didn't start that way with that, with that idea. Well, but, but would it be fair that our residential competition now is Ventura and Lompoc? You know, we would like, we, we are seeing a kind of competition for our housing stock. And just like downtown saw competition from La Cumbre Plaza and reacted in a positive way, I don't see why we can't be applying that same kind of thinking to our residential um, situation in the city planning for it, taking control of it. I know it's a workshop session, so I'm having dialogue. Excuse me. We can talk about it. Oh, please, go ahead. That's what, that's what it's about. Okay. Well, I, I did want to 
double check. John, you said it's affordability versus community character? Uh, no, I'm, I'm saying that oftentimes that, that those two goals compete with one another. And the idea is that we want to be able to resolve that and achieve both. And, the, and it's, uh, it's been the character of the city to say, yes, we want both, you know, and we, in fact, we demand both. And, and so, but it's, it's a hard road to hoe here. And so we have to look at it from as many different angles as we can. And, you know, frankly, that's one of the reasons why we brought the economic consultant on board is to look at and give us an independent perspective of, geez, does this pencil, you know, making smaller units, does it pencil? And if so, gosh, you know, can the community still uh, feel comfortable with 60 dwelling units per acre? I mean, and that's kind of what it comes down to. And, geez, what will that look like and where might it go? And, you know, so we have to, I mean, at least from a pre professional point of view, those are the kind of things that I feel like, you know, I, I have to understand and, and bring to the table. Oh, well, I, um, I was a little bemused to notice that CEC sent out a notice to its members asked, telling them about this work session and urging them to come. And at the top, they had a photograph of Casa de las Fuentes, yeah. 34 feet high, uh, high density. I think it's 54, 54 units 54 per unit, right? Okay. Yeah. And, but very small units. Right. And totally affordable because it was funded with public money. Exactly. And I, uh, you know, and everybody, you know, I'd be perfectly happy to see development like that on every street corner in Santa Barbara. It fits in with the community. It's, and and this is sort of a side issue for me, but they're very livable. There's open space within the project. They have open decks and views and all those good things. Uh, and so it depends, I think, on, on how you're paying for it, whether there's a conflict or not, and. From my point of view, 60 units to the acre is more Chapala one, and that is not acceptable. Actually, um, I think that uh, as, as we drive south, for instance, and we see the type of development that's occurring in Oxnard on the freeway, next to the freeway, I think we do shudder. I think when we see foam trim on the outside of buildings and stucco pla everywhere, everything having the same value, it's a rough, it's a rough, uh, it's a rough go, but not, not at 70 miles an hour. It's like, oh my God, did you see that one? So I think that what we're, what we're worried about partly would be implementation as well, because this city, as much as we would like to, I feel, has not explored things like uh, adaptive reuse of existing buildings. Uh, we're more inclined to uh, tear it down and redevelop it than we are to look from within and out and keep the appearance the same. I'm very concerned about that sort of thing and the change that would come. Developers do need their money out of a project, and uh, we, we all know what that result can bring architecturally. And in the hands of lesser gods, I love that phrase because it's the truth. We have a wonderful architectural community here who produces fabulous products. And, you know, there, there is pleasure to the eye, even in the large, even in the, some of the large, some of the large buildings we've gotten, you can still find something to please the eye. That can't be denied. And that's because there's people with moxie doing the design. But if we get out-of-town developers here, and we have them, who are doing a part of a project and, and departing, or uh, not doing the quality that they promise or see, then we have another product, and it's around for a long time, and it's big, and, you know, oh yeah, it's populated, but I think we're, we're very nervous about changing that character of the city. And that would change the character of the city, right there, done. And this is our industry's tourism. We count on it. This is what we identified as our main, our main goal. And I already hear from people who come into town, what happened here? You know, they're just blown away by what's happened in Santa Barbara. And they're sad about it. And in fact, I've, I was approached many, many times by people when I made myself a little bit accessible with that concern. Please, please, please stop what's happening. And you know, that's, it, it, you have to listen to that. You can't just go away. So I think that part of when we talk about community character is and motives and 
it's, I'm not thinking about lifestyle change as much as I'm thinking about perhaps the uh, the aesthetic change is driven by lifestyle change, and that's the, that's I think probably the main concern, and that's where the appearance of the building becomes very important. And the function in, behind the wall is not as important, but we are we're not there yet, so. Um, and that's that's the hardest part. Anybody uh, to me? Anybody want to say more? No. Let's open the public comment then. And we have a stack of public comment. And uh, so I ha and I and I'm through uh, part of a ream of paper printing it all, so that we get it in the record. Uh, I'd like to open the pub. Oh, thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else going once, going twice? You can still bring it up until we close it. So what I'm going to ask, we have to be yeah, we do have to be out of here by three. So uh, speak fast. If you send us written material, it's been uh, sent us on email, and we have read it. Is there anyone here who has not read the emails they've gotten with the public comment letters in them? Oh, I will. I, I, I printed, so no worries. Uh, excuse me? Oh, okay. If I got it, I read it. Yeah, if we got it, we read it. All right, so with that, I'll open uh, public comment with a, with a person who uh, I think was cut off last time we met, Kathy McCammon, or needed some. So are you here, Kathy? And our guidelines of time, Kathy, uh, if you can do it in, in three, that's great, If in uh, or two, rather, that's perfect. And I'd like to do two minutes, everyone. And if you are going to use more than two, I know someone has yielded their time. And so I'll add that two minutes on. So Kathy, go ahead, please. Okay, okay I'm Kathy McCammon, and I'm here speaking as an individual. I attended both the workshops, and I was extremely disappointed in them. Oh, it's not on? Dodge, start over? OK. <laughs> Uh, I'm Kathy McCammon. I'm speaking as an individual. I attended both the workshops and I was extremely disappointed in them because what I thought they were supposed to be about and what a lot of people thought was that we would discuss in general what the public wanted to see in terms of density and unit size. Instead, we were given a done deal that this is a consultant's report on the middle income housing. Um, it feels like the public was really left out of the discussion, and this is somewhat insulting to say the least. Some of the very questions you're raising today are the kind of questions that the public want to talk about. When you talk about these potential conflicts, um, affordability versus character, um, you know, where there should be the higher density has, and the mode of discussion, all that has changed since what we had heard before. And this is kind of like new information today. Um, one of the things that was very clear at the workshops was the um, consultant didn't seem to have gotten the idea that Santa Barbara doesn't want massive monstrosities like those on Chapala. Um, one of the things that keeps getting raised today in terms of the moda, you were talking about access to open space. Well, um, where's the open space? I mean, sure, I like recreational shopping, and I guess I could do the Lagoombra Plaza, but that may be not everyone's idea of open space. <laughs> recreational. Um, okay, then I really would urge you to study um, Gil Berry's alternative scenario. His approach is much more in keeping with Santa Barbara and shows that middle income units can be reduced in a much less expensive manner. Because what we're talking about is that we want more affordable units, but the model we were given has more market units than affordable, and even those affordable units are on the upper end of affordable for middle income. And we talk about, you know, having people that work walk to work and all of this, well, there are a heck of a lot of people that are going to be excluded because those units are really not affordable. Okay, um, we think that more discussion needs to happen, that there were mistakes and limitations in the report 
that really need to be addressed, like uh, the effect of the mixed use. Um, all of these things really should be considered before this goes on to council. Okay, the just kind of a la a comment. Um, I guess I'm sorry to say, but I do have a question on the consultants chosen. Um, strategic Economics, uh, if you look at their webpage, you will see that this is a consulting firm whose objective is to produce high-density projects that are transit-oriented and all of this. And their studies that they list talk about 60 units to the acre. So why can't we have consultants that are be more open and would look at Santa Barbara and its character first and not, be not given limitations seconds. and then come up with solutions that are more for Santa Barbara and are more suitable. So anyway, thank you. Thank you very much. And next we'll have Steve Americaner followed by Yates Satterley. Mr. Americaner, please. Come on up and introduce yourself. About two minutes. And I have uh, a number of extras for the public as well. Put the mic up, like that. All right. Madam Chair, uh, members of the Commission, I'm Steve Americano from the Brownstein Law Firm. I'm here representing. Uh, Andy Siebold, who is a, um, an owner of property on Allen Road. And you may remember that we addressed you about two months ago about a proposed lot split and zone change for his property. And at the time, you may recall that one of the issues that was raised by staff in the staff report had to do with the curious inconsistency between the zoning and the general plan in the Braemar Tract area. And the handout I've given you has a map on it that shows the inconsistency that we're talking about. And it's an inconsistency that affects his specific property, but it's an inconsistency that's existed for many years. And as long as you are going about the business of updating the general plan and looking at the city's land use maps, we thought it appropriate to bring this to you and put it on your radar screen. Now, I recognize this is vastly different from what everybody else in the room wants to talk about today, so I will be brief about it. The zoning on this in the Braemar Tract, which is adjacent to my client's property, is, as you can see in the hatched area, E3SD3. But the general plan designation is one dwelling unit per acre. That's just a plain inconsistency between the two. On the second page of the uh, handout are the list of reasons why we think this would be an appropriate time to correct that inconsistency and in, in what we think is, is now an outdated map. Uh, as you know, consistency between zoning and, and the general plan is sort of a hallmark of good planning. It's required by California law, has been for, I think, almost 50 years now. And uh, Santa Barbara isn't technically subject to that state law because it's a charter city, but it's a, still something that Santa Barbara has always sought to do, is to have the zoning and the general plan line up with each other. In this neighborhood, it doesn't, for a lot of historical reasons, but I think uh, history is now behind us, and it's probably time to move forward. The Braemar Tract is entirely built out. There's only one parcel, from our look at it, there's only one parcel that could be split if this general plan amendment were, were uh, to move forward. So we think as a practical matter, it really doesn't have any effect on the ground, and that's the no increase in density. And there's a prevailing development pattern there. All of the uh, lots there, nearly all the lots, have been built on already, and they've already been split. So there's really no, no impact on the ground. So we think that, to, uh, that we would recommend that the Commission take this opportunity while you're updating the general plan to get rid of this inconsistency between the general plan and the zoning and to change to the general plan designation on the Braemar Tract 
to match the zoning. And that's our recommendation and our request. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much. And next will be uh, Yates Satterley, followed by Gene Holmes. It's just my luck to follow a professional speaker. Uh, I am Yates Satterley. I am a resident of Santa Barbara. I have lived in this area longer than most of you have lived. I love my city. I'm saying the obvious when I say it's beautiful and special. And at the beginning of this discussion today, we heard about competing goals. I'm going to be very brief here. I only see two goals that I'm concerned about. One is preserving my beautiful, special city, and the other is finding a way to just continue to put more stuff inside this area. We just can't do it. We can't do it. We have a limited area. And I'm, I'm sorry for these gentlemen here whose job is to figure out ways to do that the best possible way, but I'm opposed to the whole idea. I say we've had enough. We can't keep doing this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Satterley. Uh, Jean Holmes, followed by Diane Channing. Hello, I'm Jean Holmes, and I'm speaking for the Allied Neighborhoods Association. My comments today reflect some, but not all, of the concerns that this organization has with the strategic economic study and the conclusions suggested in the staff report. We believe the favored scenario four is based on some questionable assumptions for a goal of affordable, non-subsidized housing. Lot size, one acre is very hard to come by. Lot price, the most expensive land in town. Parking, a limited amount of unbundled parking, which would probably result in more cars buying for the limited on-street parking that is available downtown. These cars would be either overflow or belong to people who chose not to rent parking spaces. If a project similar to scenario five, four were built in one of the other locations suggested in the staff report, these cars would then impact adjacent residential neighborhoods. There's also the matter of the incompatibility of such a building as proposed by scenario four with the prized small town character of Santa Barbara. As Allied has noted before, this character is not only intrinsically valuable to its citizens, but also economically important. The examples of dense housing noted by staff contain all small units, no larger market rate units, and serve people with a far lower rate of car ownership than the general population. Furthermore, the city's jobs housing imbalance would not be improved because 60% more units would be built for market than for the workforce and inclusionary. Clearly, this study is not the answer to our problem. What works for San Francisco does not work for Santa Barbara. Instead, we refer you to the excellent analysis from the CPA Land Use Committee and the very, oh pardon me, the CPA General Plan Update Committee and the very interesting proposal from Gil Barry for Scenario 5. Thank you very much. Uh, Diane Channing, followed by Connie Hanna. Diane? Oh, she left. Okay. Uh, Connie? Hanna, followed by... Uh, let me look and see if she wrote anything. Nope. Okay. Connie, followed by Gil Berry. Option number five. Good afternoon. I'm Connie Hanna speaking for the League of Women Voters. League members have attended both workshops and have read the staff report and the study. This new study says that only one model of 60 units per acre can produce any amount of more affordable middle class housing. That is roughly the model that has already been built at Chapala One. That project has been criticized by the general public and civic groups as being too tall, 
too massive and out of scale with the rest of the city. The city has an enormous stake in trying to protect the special quality of life and the small town feel that have made it famous worldwide. The League questions whether there are any properties that would be suitable for such a project, and if there are any, then those specific sites should be rezoned, but not big areas. The only projects that have ever been successfully built here at high densities were built and owned by the Housing Authority for Special Needs Residents. There's no comparability at all between those nonprofit subsidized projects and the 60 unit per acre described in the study. The League wants to congratulate the city for approving yesterday, uh, Tuesday two new affordable housing projects for the Housing Authority. We believe there have to be some other alternatives that would fit in with the character and history of Santa Barbara. There is now a great deal of agreement among most people that we do not need any more luxury condos and that we can do, en do everything we can to build more affordable units. We need to take time to figure out other approaches. There is currently a good deal of support for smaller projects put on less expensive land in the R3 and R4 zones and built in a less expensive way to provide basically less expensive housing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Gilberry and uh, Mr. Berry, you can have four minutes, uh, two for you and two for Judy Arias who yielded her time to you. Thank you. Followed by Mary Louise Days. Thank you. My name is Gil Berry. All of the scenarios studied in that consultant's narrow study were the same worst case model, which consisted of building on the most expensive commercial land in the most expensive manner of construction, with the most expensive way of providing parking, and with the highest soft cost. For example, they based their study upon an excessive 17% $3.8 million architect's fee. The Santa Barbara Housing Authority has no trouble finding qualified architects eager to work here for a 4 to 5% architectural fee. They also included a 550000 OCIP cost. OCIP is used by large San Francisco developers when building projects over $50 million. And when you, one uses OCIP, there's actually no soft cost because it's essentially paid for by a reduction in the subcontractor bids. If one used the proper soft cost, then a 40-unit per acre density scenario might pencil out with a 15% profit. And you wouldn't even need to go to 60 units. Yet another faulty assumption used in the study is that all Santa Barbara land is the same $100 a square foot. Nothing could be further from the truth. Land in Santa Barbara varies in cost between $10 and $200 a square foot, and over the last 40 years, R3 land has always been about half the cost of downtown commercial land. The material on the consultant's website indicates that they advocate for high-density transit-oriented development with a density of 60 units an acre. So it's no surprise that their study concluded a need for 60 units an acre. Faulty assumptions used in an economic study will result in faulty conclusions. The report concludes that high density is required because the model used builds the target $500,000 units at a cost of about $800,000 each. This requires them to be subsidized by having over 50% of all the units be high-end units. There's a very viable alternative model, which was not included in the study, which has been used extensively for providing affordable housing units in almost every city in the country over the last 40 years. It's called the Affordable by Design Model. 
This is the exact same model used by the City of Santa Barbara Housing Authority to successfully develop affordable units here. This alternative consists on building on R3 land, which costs about half as much, saves about $100,000 per unit. It consists of building in the most economical manner, manner which saves another about $100,000 per unit. And it consists of providing uncovered parking on grade instead of in a prohibitively expensive concrete structure, which saves yet again about $100,000 per unit. So this alternative model would allow the desired $500,000 workforce unit to be developed for about $500,000 instead of the $800,000 and only requires a density of 22 units an acre instead of the high density of 62 units an acre, which is clearly unacceptable for this community. This alternate model also works much better for the one quarter and one half acre parcels that are going to be the vast majority of the projects in the future here. It also works much better for small developers and small contractors who build unit, units at a significantly lower cost but are excluded under the consultants model as they don't have the capital or capability to build a huge four-story project with a commercial component and concrete underground parking. The staff report calls for increasing density in the commercial zone and reducing it in the R3 zone to compensate. This is the exact opposite of what should be done in order to have developers be able to pencil out affordable housing and at a lower density. The best solution to our housing problem is to put in place dual density in our R3 zone by reducing the density to 12 units an acre for projects with big units and increasing the density to 24 units per acre for the units under 1,000 square feet. Lastly, the density should be reduced in the mixed-use projects in the commercial zone in consideration of the mass and bulk of the commercial component and the parking structure, which sometimes is on grade with a concrete podium. And this would allow the floor area ratio to be around 1.0 to preserve our cherished small town character. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mary Louise Days, followed by Paul Hernotti, please. Thank you. We are speaking for the Citizens Planning Association General Plan Update Committee. There will be three speakers. I'm going to speak um, mostly on the draft land use map, which has not been presented today. It is on the one of them is on the wall behind you. First of all, we'd like to point out, since we did uh, propose an historic preservation element for the general plan that El Presidio de Santa Barbara State Historic Park is not shown as a park on Exhibit E of the staff report, nor is it identified in the June draft land use maps. This is an existing state-owned historic park with properties on four downtown city blocks, and it's a cultural attraction to visitors and local residents. The existing general plan supports the development of the state park, which incidentally is not one of those proposed for closing because it's not operated by state employees. El Pueblo Viejo Landmark District, I see it on a separate map behind you. It is not on the uh, concepts draft as a special district, nor is the Upper State Street uh, SD2 area. An ultra-high residential density of 60 units per acre is described as necessary for affordable housing in some higher density neighborhood centers, sub areas. Six of these centers are shown on Exhibit C, including one at State Street between Victoria and Arriaga Streets. This area contains several historically and architecturally significant buildings and is located within El Pueblo Viejo. The proposed plan update should specify that no ultra-high density project should be permitted to have an adverse impact on these uh, structures. The staff report um, shows that large portions of the MOTA incorporate two-family and single-family zoned sections of the city. The second unit incentives of housing policy H14 could also overdevelop many single-family zoned neighborhoods. Those incentives would encourage second units in the MOTA and allow them outside of the MOTA. Second units are not the same as granny units, as stated in the policy. Granny units are currently allowed in the municipal code with restrictions. By contrast, H14 would simply convert single-family zoning into two-family zoning. 
thus jeopardizing a core identifying feature of Santa Barbara. We request that the Planning Commission address these various inconsistencies. Several blocks of old Upper State Street between Mission Street and Constance Avenue include properties in the Upper East Side and the Upper West Side Oak Park neighborhoods. The, the, some of those are included within a moda. And the area I'm speaking of is single family zoned, a zoning classification that has been protected for many decades, as has the planted street divider. The proposed new elements should require preservation of these areas. Other long established single family zoned areas that appear to be threatened by the moda concept for increased density are several San Roque neighborhoods, including some very uh, quite high priced, very nice ones nearly half of the Samarkand neighborhood and portions of the Hope Lacumber area. We also request that the county courthouse and city government offices and facilities be shown on the maps as major public institutional or institutional. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Her or Dr. Hernadi, followed by Naomi Kovacs. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, I am the second of three speakers uh, on behalf of the Citizens Planning Association's General Plan Update Committee. <coughs> Our letter noted that uh, we sent you a letter, which I think you received on Monday, and our letter could you, noted that... Could you that please the, move the microphone yeah, closer? Is there a real mouth? problem here? I couldn't it's hear other speakers either. Okay, just keep it close to you. Thanks. Do you think that would that be would good? Be okay. Thank you. It's better? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our letter noted that the worldwide competition for real estate in the Santa Barbara area makes our jobs housing imbalance a huge challenge. Even the presumably most promising scenario of the recent feasibility study would produce considerably more market rate than affordable units and would thus increase the jobs housing imbalance and decrease our city's economic and cultural diversity. In other words, the proposed cure would make the disease even more severe. In our letter we ask, wasn't the feasibility study way too narrow? It did demonstrate the obvious, namely that the private sector can't and won't build our way out of the jobs housing imbalance. But the consultant was not charged to assess the economic feasibility of a number of more promising alternative remedies for the jobs housing imbalance and the associated long-distance commuting. These remedies might have included, first, promoting or even requiring employer-supported rental and ownership housing, not mentioned at all, in the, at all in the study. This would enlarge our stock of affordable housing without adding job-generating market rate units to the mix, and also assist employers in recruitment and retention. Second, persuading voters to approve bond issues for producing a significant amount of affordable workhouse housing. And the voters may be persuaded if they realize that some of the new units could enable middle-income nurses and public safety workers to reside closer to where their services are so critically needed. Third, building more economically and on less expensive land than the methods and locations evaluated in the consultant study. A preliminary draft of architect Gilberry's scenario along such lines was favorably reviewed by our committee. Fourth, making long commutes less detrimental to the environment through increased support for alternative transportation by bus, train, van pools, and ride sharing. Is this economically feasible? Perhaps it should be studied whether it is. And uh, f finally, uh, um, one could have uh, explored the feasibility of adopting a dual density policy in appropriate commercial and multifamily multi zones to curb the production of large units and stimulate the production of housing that is affordable either by law or by design. Our particular proposal um, in the letter uh, would uh, increase the availability of affordable housing without increasing the total number of units permitted in the city. And of course the city itself has some ideas along these lines. We hope that our ideas will also be considered. 
uh, and uh, just two short points about uh, how our committee wondered whether the consultant's approach to developer profit was sufficiently cir circumspect. First, for example, why was it overlooked that some owners and developers may have acquired the land in question years ago at even lower than the current depressed prices? And secondly, why did the study fail to calculate the extra profit that can be derived from selling or leasing the commercial component of a new mixed house, of a new mixed use development, or, and this is very important, from selling the so-called development rights attached to any demolished and not rebuilt part of an existing commercial development. There is a lot more in the letter, but I appreciated your indulgence of letting me at least give some of the highlights. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Naomi Kovacs, followed by Kellum DeForest. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, I am Naomi Kovacs. I'm the Executive Director of Citizens Planning Association, and I will wrap up CPA's comments on the matter. Um, in addition to its other input to you, our General Plan Update Committee appreciates this opportunity to point out a few anomalies in the development feasibility study. There are discrepancies in the use of the terms inclusionary and workforce units. In most local discussions of the city's inclusionary housing ordinance, the terms are used virtually synonymously, but not so by the consultant for this feasibility study. The study points out that households earning up to 160 percent of AMI qualify for inclusionary units, but it goes on to state that for the purposes of this study, workforce, houses are de workforce households are defined as those earning between 130 and 200 percent of AMI. Furthermore, when the two categories are associated with a four-person household, they maintain this overlap between 130 and 160 percent of AMI, but for a three-person household, suddenly there's a 30 percent gap between the two categories where inclusionary tops off at 130 percent of AMI and workforce starts at 160. There are also discrepancies between the comparative summary tables in the consultants and staff's PowerPoint presentations that were presented at the June workshops. This seems to be the result of conflicting definitions of scenarios number three and four in their respective presentations. Unfortunately, it's not made clear whether, and if so, how, the consultant's final report of July 10th and staff's report of July 16th resolved these and other discrepancies between the two PowerPoint presentations. Following our General Plan Update Committee's submission of comments, our, our South County Land Use Committee also discussed the study. And because of the serious outstanding issues that still exist, and also taking into consideration the very thoughtful and detailed comments that Mr. Gilberry submitted to you, um, which offer a potential fifth scenario to consider, our Land Use Committee respectfully requests that you continue this work session so that there may be further discussion and opportunity to explore Mr. Berry's scenario five and to answer some of the existing discrepancies and questions that remain. We hope that you'll take that step to continue this discussion so that we'll have the most fruitful and best process and outcome possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Kellum DeForest, followed by Dick Jensen. Good afternoon. I'm Kellum DeForest. And I want to say that it seems obvious that I think got this right, that market-driven units with the requirement that affordable units be included, that scenario is not working. What is being produced are units for weekend or vacation visitors. They're the ones that buy these condos. Doesn't provide housing for anyone. I believe the only way affordable housing can be made available for essential workers such as firefighters, uh, hospital personnel, etc., is through housing subsidized by the employers, either be they either public or private. This is the approach that has worked at UCSB in their faculty-owned housing condos on their west campus. So. Also, I do not think enough attention is being made, it has been brought up, to the 
a study and possibly even subsidize for rehabilitating our existing historic, or some of it's historic, but our existing housing stock. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dick Jensen, please, followed by Tom Bollet. Yes, I'm Dick Jensen here as an individual. Uh, in particular, I'm here because I was driven by fear. Uh, fear of when Casa de la Fuentes was built, I thought, what a bogus deal. One space per apartment, no way that's going to use. They're going to have parking all over the street. So I watched it like a hawk. I went by every time I went downtown. I'd make a point of going past there. And what I saw was the garage never filled up. Six, seven, eight years later, the garage has never filled up. I was wrong. I was absolutely incorrect. When you have the right assumptions about transportation access and the predictability to the residents that transportation will be available, you end up getting a different result. I thought it was a wonderful building. Uh, I think it is a wonderful building. And when you realize a car takes up at least 300 square feet, those kinds of numbers you've been talking about there means cars take up a lot of space. What's the answer? The answer is when you've got transportation corridors, you should have the kind of housing that allows people to live there without a car. The idea that you're somehow or another going to just reduce the number of parking spaces without providing alternatives to people to park a car means they're going to park it on the street. There was recently an argument about a condominium at 1620 Garden Street about how all you had to do is park in the street because there was plenty of space. That's bogus because the fact is all that does is make everyone else's situation bad in order to take care of one situation. So I would simply say make sure it's predictable for the builders. Good point. Make sure it's predictable for the residents. It's essential that you talked about the predictability of the residents. You just don't leave it up to chance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Jensen. Uh, Tom Boulay, please, followed by Megan Burney. Hi, my name is Tom Boulay, um, former uh, Historic Landmarks Commissioner, and I've been to most of your uh, planned Santa Barbara's. Unfortunately, I was out of town uh, for the two June meetings, so I was not able to comment. Um, I want to support the Citizens Planning Association and Gil Berry's proposal number five. What I'm actually passing out is an additional proposal, uh, option number six. Um, I was very intrigued by Gil's approach, and what I wanted to do is, is uh, address maybe a, an in-between size project. So I actually took uh, similar circumstances to the project on Coast Village Road, where it was an 18,000 square foot site. Um, there's 13,000 square feet of residential development and 5,000 square feet of commercial development. And I wanted to just test it to see if it would work or if it would meet the 15% uh, percent affordability. Uh, in doing the uh, spreadsheet, I laid it out very similar to how Gil had done his. And uh, I came up with a 15% profit for the developer. I was also able to explore a different mix for the uh, luxury versus workforce versus inclusionary. And w in my numbers, I discovered that the luxury could balance the inclusionary, so they should be almost equal. So if you put in two luxury, you could get two inclusionary out of the deal. And then as far as workforce, if you reduce the cost for a standard condo, from the consultants, I think it was 800000 to something more realistic, 650, which is someone one of my employees might be able to afford, um, and then balance the workforce at 500000 It actually uh, comes out to be a viable project at a density of just 12 units for a half-acre parcel or about 29, acres, uh, 29 units per acre. Um, it's also interesting to see I've used the smaller square footages on these that the total FAR, including commercial, comes out to about 1.0 1, 1 or 100 percent of uh, floor area. And in my studies when I was helping with rewriting the um, Historic Landmarks Commission's guidelines, we studied the existing FAR downtown and I've also done some studies on Coast Village Road. The existing FAR downtown is about 60%. So even if you only built two-story projects, which is what this is proposing, you could increase the FAR.
they are downtown by almost double, which I think is probably greater than the traffic can support, even with the, the moda. Um, and I think we ought to consider a smaller density like this in a broader portion of the community. And Bendy, I think you were right on as far as other potential areas where this could work. I think this could work on Coast Village Road because it's two stories. I think it could work uh, along Cabrillo Boulevard near the beach. And I think uh, we need to address the Coastal Commission with using some of our beach areas for housing as well as visitor serving, not just vacation condos or more hotels. I don't think we need that. That's exacerbating our, our workforce issues. I think we should also explore uh, the, the M1 zones that are near the beach. We've got this wonderful resource. And I, th I think that leads me back to my final point is just about some of the assumptions the MODA makes. The assumptions that MODA makes is that we're only going to put housing where we have existing transportation. And I think a better approach might be is let's choose the best place to put housing and then let's plan to create transportation for those areas. For example, along Cabrillo Boulevard would be a wonderful, we've got parks and beach the full length of Cabrillo. We could create bus service. It already has bike routes. It would be an, it would be an easy add to this. And so I think we should just shift our thinking to where, should we, where would we like to have housing? Because I think for this to really be successful, we need to compete with the single family home scenario in Oxnard. We need to make this more desirable as opposed to just cheaper. If we can have housing that's inexpensive and close to the beach, that becomes more desirable than commuting to Oxnard. And I think that's where this whole model starts to become more successful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Megan Burney, followed by Michael Chiakos. Good afternoon. My name is Megan Burney. I'm with the Community Environmental Council, and I want to start this afternoon by thanking uh, city staff and the commission for hiring uh, Strategic Economics. I think they did a fantastic job with an objective report. Oftentimes we get stuck, we you know, get caught up in, in what we're doing here, and we forget what we're trying to accomplish, which is, in the end, to lay the groundwork for a livable, a viable, a sustainable, and a beautiful community. And I think that's something that we can all agree on is, is what we're trying to do here. Um, this meeting and this plan isn't really about density and building heights. It's actually about creating housing, homes and communities for everyone. And it's about quality of life for those who work here, those who live here, and those who are tourists as well. And I think the main key is to provide, provide options. And that's one thing we, we like about the general plan we're seeing is that there are a lot of options included. Um, for people who ask who wants to live in 60 units per acre or who wants to live in a dense downtown, me. Hi. That's me. <laughs> um, you know, I, and I think we forget that. I think that face is lost a lot. A lot of people of my demographic aren't necessarily in a position of life where they can come to a meeting in the middle of the day and, and, have, and share their viewpoints, but, but there's a lot of us out there. So um, I really want to emphasize that it's options here. We're not asking for, you know, 60-foot buildings across the entire downtown, but we also aren't asking for, you know, 40-foot buildings. It should be an option. There should be 10, 20, and 60-foot buildings. So really looking at that entire picture and, and allowing for that. Um, we do support staff's recommendations. We do support um, denser development within the MODA. I think the gentleman who just spoke previously had some great points as well. Um, again, it's about those options, looking about where we want housing, where we want transit, and really making sure that they all work together. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the Community Environmental Council, you know that our main goal is to move away from our dependence on fossil fuels in the next generation. This is a great side benefit to uh, denser development. We all know for a fact that denser development has a lower carbon footprint. We drive less, we, u we use less energy. Um, and this will also help the city meet their goals of AB 32 and SB 375, which were mentioned earlier. So. Again, just I really encourage the, the commission to make sure that there are options for everyone and not to limit ourselves um, by putting fake numbers on densities and fake numbers on heights. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael Chiakos, followed by Britta Bartles. Hello, my name is Michael Chiakos. I'm the transportation specialist at the Community Environmental Council. And CEC strongly supports the workforce housing density overlays. And on a personal level, I'm very excited to see this happening. I was born here in Santa Barbara, 
when I was 17, I left to go to university, lived in other places for a decade, and recently came back a few years ago. My family, my community is here. Um, I can afford to rent here, but I could only afford to buy in Ventura or Lompoc. There are 30,000 commuters coming every day from North County and Lompoc and uh, Ventura. This is ridiculous. Our current policies are encouraging luxury second homes for rich citizens of the world, while 30,000 people commute every day because we can't build more affordable workforce housing. Do you think all these people want to spend two to three hours in their cars every day instead of with their family or doing more fun things? We just started widening 101, and in the next decade or two, we'll spend a billion dollars on that. Is that an effective or necessary use of our tax money? As the consultant report shows, there is a large untapped demand for moderately sized, middle income, one and two bedroom properties. This is a no brainer, let's do it. I have a few questions. Why aren't we encouraging more employer built housing so that cottage employees can walk to work? Why did the city shrink the moda, it left out City College, the West Side, the um, Coastal Zone, the Funk Zone, these are all great places. By the train station, these are all great places for housing. I like that the city is considering unbundled parking, but what about going further? What about promoting car sharing in one of these developments? Zipcar is already out at UCSB. The pilot program was recently expanded. Now the county redevelopment agency is considering expanding the car sharing program to Isla Vista. Why don't we expand the fleet by providing a, a car shared node down here in downtown Santa Barbara tied into one of these projects? Scenario four shows an example, 62 units with 81 parking spaces. Could the 62 units only need 40 parking spaces if car sharing was provided and make things cheaper? I drive my car once a week. I know dozens of people in the same situation, and I would gladly get rid of it and the space it takes up and all the fixed costs of insurance, registration, leasing if I had access to this car sharing. The develop developer could sell it as an amenity Right? Instead of having one car, a car share could choose a Prius or a neighborhood electric vehicle if they run errands. They could use a SUV when they want to go camping or a convertible smart car if they want to take their girlfriend on a date. Studies show that by converting the fixed cost of car ownership to variable costs, car, share, share, car shares choose transit and healthy modes like walking and biking more often. So in conclusion, the city should consider innovative development Something like, say, over a downtown parking lot. Take that underutilized one near FedEx. We could sell the property and help make up for recent budget deficits, take a 100-year lease on the first floor parking lot, incentivize a developer to build work workforce housing above, sell unbundled parking to those who want it, provide car sharing for those who want it, and then by reducing this parking through car sharing, housing prices would become even more affordable. City or other businesses could save money by using the car sharing to replace underutilized vehicles in the fleet. So these ideas are already happening in large cities. Let's make Santa Barbara a leader in creative, urban, problem solving among small cities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Britta Bartles followed by Mickey Flax. Good afternoon, Commissioners. My name is Britta Bartels and I have to say I was very touched this morning by reading the newspaper because um, I think that our public is not enough involved in deciding what they want to be done and what they can make changed. And um, I got this newspaper article today and there was a nice um, picture on it with an ear that is blocked by some brick wall where a human being wants to walk through or get in. And I thought this is something very nice to uh, bring up to the publicity, actually, because our community is constantly complaining about things or projects that don't get done, followed up on, and that our city is getting worse and that buildings look uglier. And especially, I would like to address a concern in regards to a project I have been really working on recently. Our east side neighborhood um, feels like the people that live there are not really included in what's going on with our city development. They are very ignorant. And this article was saying another chance to be ignorant. And that will actually mention also, if you want to read it, I don't want to read the whole thing, that um, it accuses the planning division or commissioners of not listening to the public what they want to be done or get done or changed. 
And I think it's somehow true that it causes also a, a reaction in our community that the community is becoming very ignorant too. So it's coming from both sides. And um, I think we have this KYT channel where they always say great things about Santa Barbara, but they never really advertise for public meeting or public hearings where this film should be filled right now with people who are bothered or concerned. They want to make this get changed. And I feel like I'm always talking to the wall when I ask my clients when I'm at work, what do you think about this and that? And they say, oh, well, yeah, that's okay, and why not, and maybe we shouldn't. So why don't they just stand up and say this is not okay? And I, um, I also I would like to address that I'm very kind of concerned about our east side neighborhood, how it will actually get worse again. It has been improving over years after it was like the ugliest, dirtiest, lowest energized uh, neighborhood and people have been working on their front yards, backyards and they, they love the fact that they have Trader Joe's there and people come there and we have this fancy roundabout that's getting a lot of confusion going sometimes. And, but the further we go up on Milpas away from the, from the beach, the people, yes, the people are actually not knowing what's going on and they are left out. And, and we have two dispensaries now approved within 510 feet on Milpas. And I think we should approve them inside the city hall so they can be more observed by the ordinance. So thank you so thank much you. for listening. Have a good day. <laughs> uh, Joanne Derlitis. Oh, I'm sorry. Mickey Flax. <clears throat> Just want to make sure I'm in order here. Followed thank you. <clears throat> I apologize for coming late. Um, I have a very good excuse. I was at a meeting of the Affordable ha Counties, Cities, Affordable Housing Task Force. Uh, because that, as you may know, is my primary concern. My other concern, however, um, is uh, the fact that we are choking on our cars, that we are not only breathing polluted air, but our, as everybody knows, our planet is uh, in grave danger. And any time some groups or experts come up with ideas that would change that, there are those in this community who say, oh no, oh no, we don't want to change anything. We have one of the most beautiful and wonderful cities in the world, which we do. And therefore, there's an assumption that change is negative. Change will make it worse. And I happen to believe that that's not necessarily true. Um, I urge you to listen to the enthusiasm of the young people from CEC who see all kinds of new ways of living, not just of building, but of living with shared cars, with a sense of community, with uh, willingness and indeed eagerness to walk and bike and not depend on cars. That is the kind of future that we ought to be planning, not looking back to the past. Last night I went to an opening of a new development on Chapala. Uh, it's got some catchy name which I forget, but it's eight units of luxury housing. That's exactly what we don't want. And yet that development fits all of the guidelines. It's 40 feet. Uh, it's only eight units. Uh, it's uh, beautiful. It's got all kinds of doodads. It's got open space. And yet that's not what we want. I suspect they did eight units because with nine they would have had to have inclusionary. Uh, and they're trying to maximize their return. We do not need luxury housing except the minimal amount that we need to subsidize, and indeed that is the name of the game, that's where we're at. There doesn't seem to be any other funding for subsidizing workforce housing. Affordable housing, that, that capital, what I call capital A affordable housing, subsidized housing that the housing authority builds is subsidized with funds from outside of this community. Housing for the workforce has no subsidy. Employers provide some, yes, and they had a hell of a time. Cottage Hospital had a hell of a time trying to get its housing approved from the very people who are now saying, well, we need employers to provide housing. Folks, we have to be responsible. We have to reduce automobile use. We have to build housing for the, whether it's 25 or 30,000 workers who commute, some of them. If we take 12, according to SBCAG, if we take 1,200 commuters off the highway, we wouldn't need the third lane that's costing us millions. 1,200 commuters. We can't 
build in low, small units, eight units here and 10 units here and 12 units there, we're past that. We need to understand that we need some large developments in motors where people can use alternative transportation and where they seconds. can be housed in dignity. The only specific proposal I would make is I think there should be some formula between unit size and high density. The smaller the units, the higher the allowable density. Once you start building larger units, even on the same site, the larger units would have a small, a lower density than the smaller units. That kind of proposal and others like them is the forward thinking that we need. Please lead the way. Don't drag your feet. Thank you. Thank you. you. Uh, Joe Andrelitis, followed by Peter Hunt. Two minutes, please. Good, Good afternoon. Day. My name is Joe Andrelitis. I'm a um, board member of the local AIA chapter. Uh, I'm just going to read through some of the points AIA wants to um, speak about, and then I'll just have some personal comments um, after that. Uh, AIA Santa Barbara has advocated for some time to change the variable density formula uh, so it's based on unit size rather than bedroom count. So we're pleased to see that that change is being addressed. So thanks. We support the concept of the moda um, and like that the boundaries have moved to mid-block rather than the center line of the streets. Uh, we'd like to suggest adding blocks maybe facing Anapamu Street Corridor running east and along the Milpa Street Corridor running north. I think that's an important transit corridor that you may address. And there were some other comments that I thought were um, areas that needed to be added. I do think um, there's some comments regarding the single-family zones in the moda, and I do think those should be excluded. I think we want to preserve those neighborhoods. Um, we support unbundled parking and the one space per unit requirement. Uh, I had the, I was fortunate to, enough to talk to John Ledbetter and he contacted. Excuse me, Joe. And this the, the the piece about what you think, this doesn't count against your time, um, uh, about what should be excluded from the MOTA? Did you, did you have? Uh, the single family neighborhoods such as San Roque, part of the east side and Samarkand. Okay. I mean, are we really, you know, we're not going to change those. Those right. aren't going to get more okay. dense. Thank you. I mean, we just protect that neighborhood zone and, and the other areas that are included uh, out of that area should be part of the MOTA. Um, John Ledbetter contacted me a couple weeks ago and um, asked our chapter to request uh, our help in illustrating what some of these projects might look like uh, within the context of the MOTA. So we're in the process of forming a subcommittee um, to address the request and look forward to holding a charrette with local architects along with members of the community to bring some vision into these proposed policies, because I think a lot of people are having trouble visualizing what this is actually going to look like and impact on the city. Um, lastly, the last comment is, rather than capping the density on R3 and R4 lots, um, why not consider FARs with minimum density standards? Uh, this will allow flexibility in the range of unit sizes offered while still, still encouraging smaller unit sizes. In addition, the FARs and density standards can be adjusted based on their relationship to the central business district properties closer to the CBD would receive a higher FAR and minimum density standard, while properties closer to residential neighborhoods would receive lower FARs and lower minimum density standards. This would address the perceived threat of higher density neighborhood centers on surrounding lower scale neighborhoods. And lastly, on a personal level, I did go to the workshop on Thursday, and um, I thought it was poorly attended by young people, as I've always been advocating to get young people involved here, and I really appreciate Megan coming and getting her perspective, because I think that's the perspective we really li need to listen to. Um, you know, not to criticize the older generation, but, you know, the older generation has lived a certain way, they're used to living that way, and I think you need to embrace what the younger generation wants to do and how they want to change things. Um, you know, if I were to try to buy a home here today, I couldn't. I'm a business owner, I have a family of two, and I couldn't buy a home here today. And it's I'd either have to rent a home or, you know, live in Ventura. And there's a lot of other, you know, we talk about character of the city, but it seems like a shallow discussion to me because all it is is about buildings and heights and density. And I think it needs to be about people. Um, you know, if I didn't live here, I wouldn't be coaching my daughter's soccer team here in town. I wouldn't be serving on the AIA board and doing community service. I wouldn't be, um, you know, my, my daughter's in a flamenco dance class, and 80% of those people in that class drive up from Oxnard. She can't have a sleepover with the friends she made. I mean, there's all these other impacts that, that people need to understand about the character of the people living here when, when they have to commute. And I think that needs to be addressed in the character discussion. It's not just about buildings and what it looks like. It's about people. And if, if we can't get people to live here that work here, that has every, much, just as much impact on the viable, you know, livable part of our city than anything else. So I, I strongly urge you to, 
to, to look at the character of the people and how all these policies are going to affect them. So thank you. Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, Mr. Andrew, Andrew, Joe, did did you? I did not see written, your written comments. If you if you did submit them, yeah, I didn't submit written okay. comments. Would you I, put that together into a written sure. comment? So I, I know you have, you you speak so fast, and there's yeah. uh, dense words there. So okay. uh, help us with that. No problem. Thank you, uh, Peter Hunt, followed by Alex Pujol. Hello, my name is Peter Hunt. I'm an architect in town. You know, when I moved to town when I was 23 years old, I couldn't afford a house either. I bought my first house in Ventura when I was 27, 28 years old. And uh, through hard work, I was able to buy a house in Santa Barbara. I think it's possible. I think it still can be done. There's some guy crawling under a fence right now um, who uh, doesn't even speak English, will probably own houses in Santa Barbara. Also, I heard about how dirty the air is today, and, and the doors open. And I don't know about the air pollution. I think it's pretty clean. Um, I would like to uh, make some comments about um, the general plan and, um, and some facts, first of all. Um, as you know, over 50% of the revenue in the city of Santa Barbara comes from tourism. And as a result, I think it's very important that we um, maintain what it is that tourists like about coming to Santa Barbara. And I would question loading up downtown with a lot of housing. I think there may be unintended consequences there. However, it is important that we have more housing. And it is very remarkable that Santa Barbara is delightful for tourists. And so I would suggest that we look at the Delavina Alomar State Street Triangle. And we would look at the Hitchcock Freeway State Street Triangle and say, well, you know, these are areas that maybe aren't as delightful as downtown, but they could be. And we could introduce mixed use housing there. We could uh, provide more uh, street grid system, better sidewalks. Um, more entertainment for people, um, and all the things that make downtown wonderful could happen there, and we could then improve Santa Barbara and make it, uh, and in other words, make the pie larger. Or make it, is that a bigger, better pie, or is that just a better pie? But uh, confining our thinking to downtown solely um, may not actually be the best solution, and so I would ask that the Planning Commission consider uh, creative responses to our problems. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alex Pujol, followed by Lee Moldover. Good afternoon. I'm Alex Pujol, speaking as an individual. And I'd like to talk a little bit about change. And I like it when people talk about cars and change and what you're trying to do. But be careful. You know, if we talk about EPV, creek setbacks, Highway 101, emission corridor, uh, the building, height, uh, building heights and the scale of buildings and the view corridors and the traffic at the 101 intersections and the SD2 traffic overlay, the question really is, do you want to do something or you want to do nothing? I mean, I, I know the do nothing thing because we have that. In my neighborhood, we do have MODA. We don't call it MODA. We call it uh, illegal granny units. And, and I remember some time about 12, 15 years ago, in which it was a, a group more or less like this, and we had to talk about uh, granny units. And we did work really hard, and we came up with a, uh, a law to address the state mandates. And how many legal granny units have been built since 1992? Is it six? Is it five? I have more on my own block, which to all of you would look like a single family residence, which it is, really. So a little bit of a, 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 a caution about that. And also, if you're trying to create housing, be a little, you know, if you make them tight size and now we're having low ceilings and, well, it's single use. So you're going to have somebody on the first floor with a small house, a tight ceiling. And that's what? I mean, I can see the, the, uh, the concerns. The, uh, small houses do work. They have to be elevated. They have to have a balcony. And a, a, a higher ceiling helps a lot. It is possible, but... You're tightening up the envelope to, to the degree that I'm, I'm afraid nothing will come out of this, and we're going to have less, and we're going to have smaller units, and not any more of that. I agree with many people who spoke, uh, including Ms. Jacobs, that this is not a new idea, and you see the drawings around here. This is the, this is the original idea, where density belongs downtown, no someplace else. This is nothing new. This is the old story. The new story is the car and the sprawl and bringing people away. And I agree with plan four and five and six, and all of those, they are very nice. We need all of them. 
because to build where the land is cheaper, not so high with the parking and so forth, that's called sprawl. We already had that. We need to move forward. I'm, I'm glad to see, to see the CEC people, the younger people, the younger people who don't attend these meetings, people of color that don't attend these meetings. And I really resent a little bit the older generation that will not see the results of their advocacy because this moves on 30 years from now, 40 years from now. We're not going to be here. And, and we are putting this cloud over the future. I agree with Joe's comments. It's the people that matter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Lee Muldover, followed by Chuck Davis. Uh, morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners. I'm Lee Maldiver. First of all, uh, thank you for holding this open workshop. Uh, I think it's been one of the better ones in the Plan Santa Barbara process. I want to especially indicate, rather than taking up your time, that I've heard interesting new things that I really agree with or I'd like to explore further from uh, Gil Berry and Tom Bollet, Aaron Burney, <laughs> Michael Chiacos, Mickey Flax, and Joe Andrelides. And I heard earlier, I can't remember who the speaker was, uh, a suggestion that there might be enough new material for consideration to continue the meeting and or direct the staff and the consultant to consider uh, one more scenario option. And I think that there's been um, enough substance here today and enough new ideas that were inspired by the consultant's report that it might be worthwhile con continuing the meeting. Uh, as a former board member of the uh, ECP, I think that what is on the table now is very close to our principle number four, which is to add new housing where it's appropriate to the zoning and the general plan and infrastructure already exists to accommodate it. So I'm um, a strong supporter of that. I also would like to point out, as several speakers have mentioned, that one thing that we do not need between Plan Center over the next general plan is anything more than the minimum uh, of market housing. And the goal should be affordable housing no matter which formula you use to define it. And any time that we're getting too many large units to get one or two affordable ones, I think is a step in the wrong direction. I would also like to point out that I, I've been doing consulting for years, so I appreciate where the consultant is at, you know, and paying them $20 and borrowing their watch to tell you what time it is. Uh, the idea of the 15% return, the, the idea of the f mandatory 15% return for developers to do what the market in this community requires, I'd like to point out to you that that was the exact same return for 15 years that Bernie Madoff offered investors around North America and around the world, and it was considered such a robust, uh, uh, exuberant return uh, that people who could only get 4 or 5% of certificates of deposit were beating down his door to help him to steal his money. So if we're looking at a community general plan to meet community needs for our service workers and for our young people, I think that we should ask the consultants to re-examine whether that is the only way to get it. Finally, as someone who at one point I'd been on the MTD board more than all the other board members combined, uh, that's probably no longer true. I'd like to refer you back to something that Mr. Bollet indicated. One of the advantages of public transit as opposed to commuter rail or fixed rail is that as population and commerce centers change, the community and the riders can work with the transit district to change the routes and the level of service. And keep in mind right now that if you approved all the things that are on the table for Plan Santa Barbara, you adopted the MODA, it is totally beyond MTD's capacity to accommodate it. And funding is looking at being slashed uh, rather than expanded. So uh, I agree with Mr. Chiakas, that's the vision of the future. And uh, Mr. Pujol's right, you have the future in your hands, and I couldn't think of a better place to do it. But I think there have been so many good ideas that I think it would be worthwhile to bring the consultants back one more time, continue the meeting, try to come up with another scenario that captures some of the great ideas you've gotten today. And Madam Chair, thank you again for holding this meeting. Oh, thank you. My pleasure.
Uh, Chuck Davis. Yeah. Chuck Davis going once. Oh, here he comes. Good. Yeah, we had to make you do a lap to get up here. Breaking speed record. I apologize. I was not That's leaving right. the room. I was trying to make a circle. Uh, for the record, Chuck Davis with the Mace Rich Company. We own La Cumbre Plaza. And I uh, just thought there were some things. I know uh, I've read all the documents, a lot of very interesting information, and we've been following the process up to this point. I think I spoke to a couple of the members here uh, that came to one of our events last fall as we've been um, renovating the center. Um, we acquired the center, I think, the end of 2004, and we've been pretty aggressively working to try to reposition it, both from a retailing and merchandising, a, a more general uh, presentation to match the community, but also aesthetically so that I'd say that it is less of a dated strip center and more of a, a, a really an anchor to that uh, upper State Street area. Uh, a couple things I think that are important when looking at our property. Uh, it seems like that it does come up in, in many conversations we've had, but sometimes I think that people don't quite understand exactly the logistics of our site. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a, uh, an understanding of that. Um, the center was Ernie Hahn's first development. Uh, first shopping center. That's a, a nice thing to a little feather in your cap. He really was perhaps the greatest developer on the West Coast um, for the, the, the life of the Han Corporation. But this shopping center was developed on five separate ground leases. We don't own the land. We essentially, from five different people, have different parcels that are aggregated together, and we have different terms, some several decades, some only a couple of decades. So when you're looking at least on the housing element and, and some of those pieces that are important, I think at least if somebody is looking at La Cumbre Plaza as an opportunity in the city, they should understand ownership on that site is just not realistic um, if we were to look at being able to do something there. Further, the department stores are on their own ground leased parcels, separate from ours. So they have their own rules and their own terms, and, uh, and, and they would have their essentially their own rights. Um, mixed use uh, as a goal is fine. We do have mixed use developments within our portfolio. Redmond Town Center has extensive office, hospitality, retail, entertainment. Uh, we just uh, kicked off uh, about a three and a half million square foot expansion with extensive retail, um, residential, hospitality and office at Tyson's Corners in Virginia which is on the metro extension out to Dulles Airport. It makes sense in the right locations and in the right circumstances. But we are first First and foremost, a retail business. We're a Wall Street uh, REIT, and we're governed by uh, analysts and all of those efforts, as well as our shareholders. And we don't essentially do mixed use and, and residential on its own right generally as our as a primary business. That's an ancillary business if it makes sense and cooperative to the primary business. Um, Valuation, I was just taking a look at this. I think that's something a, a lot of times we hear with cities, and believe me, on the West Coast, and I work on all of our Bay Area properties, and two in Marin, and the comment a lot of times is, well, you got all those free parking lots. Well, those parking lots aren't free. Those parking lots are commensurate with the shopping. They're an expectation of the customer, and their obligations within our leases as well as with our department stores to maintain and provide for them. So it's not free land, and the replacement of that, um, 100 bucks a square foot would basically replace enough parking with absolutely no architectural character on the outside of it whatsoever. So that's a little bit that you know that's at the very low end. That's about 25 to 30 thousand of parking space to replace, and it costs far more than that to have the expectation that this town has. Um, we think that um, we can see the value of having the mixed use and the density and those things there, but frankly, we would want to be incentivized is, is there enough ground floor retail opportunity for us to really augment and fully develop that center so that it really does become a, a qualitative HUD? And that's the, that's the type of incentive that we would be looking for. What that means, I don't know. Typically in cities we go down the road and actually look at mixed use studies and those types of things to see that uh, you know what could happen. But we've been really kind of sitting back to find out exactly where the city's plans and thoughts are lying in terms of its housing needs demands and how they want to allocate it. Uh, anything that we do in our pri property requires uh, full and uh, full approval of all the underlying landowners and the department stores. Uh, we're governed by a document called a, a reciprocal easement agreement. It's kind of like a CCNR in their very 
tough and they basically say any significant change to the site plan requires approval and it's not reasonable approval it's unilateral approval so even some of the changes we're making now we have to get our department stores on board with some of those things we are open to a dialogue and shared goals for the expectations and desires of the city and ourselves but it will take time patience and flexibility and we know it's a bit of chicken and the egg and we think this is a good time to have the discussion um, if we are incentivized appropriately, then, then there is an appropriate level of ground level commercial to augment what we have. Then we can start looking at ways to help really meet the city's goals and needs. It's a very difficult time for retail today. We're working hard, even in this tough time, to improve La Cumbre Plaza and to take it to a level that the local uh, residents um, expect and the experience they want. We just got design review board approval for Vaughn's to go in and finally facelift that store that's been really not very attractive for some time and we also got an approval for another couple stores to create a little more qualitative entrances and towers and if you know the center you know the exterior of it looked like the backside of an industrial park for a long time and we're piece by piece starting to change that so it feels welcoming and inviting as you come in. Um, we know housing is important to the city and especially workforce housing and balanced housing for the community and we're definitely here to work with you. Um, we just need to recognize and you need to recognize the constraints and the governing restrictions we have to work with and uh, I'm certainly not suggesting that mixed user housing won't happen at Lacumbre Plaza. It's just probably going to be a little more complicated than buying a piece of land and figuring out the density on it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and that ends this portion of our public comment. And I uh, printed from my, my internet what I received. So I'm going to quickly read the names and just a touch of what they said uh, because there's not time to read everything they wrote, uh, although I wish there was. Uh, Dorothy Littlejohn uh, asks, uh, says that higher density housing would be a wonderful solution as well as affordable, but, but makes note we want to be integrated into the community as a whole, mixed in with people of all incomes. Uh, from Linda Adams, supports building uh, uh, affordable workforce housing. Uh, from Energy Intern, who is Energy Intern? Okay. Uh, Challenge the Planning Commission to do both. Retain the SB charm while also planning for future sustainability. Leanne French. Um, from Nina Gelman Gons, uh, please support measures to provide affordable housing and public transportation. From Travis Madsen, uh, asks that we um, consider promoting public transit and smart growth, eliminate dependence on fossil fuels, protect open and public space. In increase options for pedestrians and cyclists, increase affordable housing, sounds like heaven. Uh, uh, I think the time has come to make State Street into a pedestrian mall between Haley and Carrillo. Uh, from Dennis Thompson, AIA, he is supporting the concept of higher density affordable housing along transit corridors. From Mike Conway, uh, please increase bicycle infrastructure, uh, higher density housing, and decrease city's dependency on fossil fuels. Um, and I do believe that that has got it. Yes. All right. Thank you. And um, I'll pass these, I guess, over and these as well. And that, and I'll close the public comment. And now we're back to the commission and um, back to the map. Any uh, further thoughts uh, here? Madam Chair, we've had a couple of requests to continue yes. this, what I think has been a very interesting and yes. profitable discussion. Um, and we did just cancel the meeting on August 12th. Is there a possibility that we continue? Because we only have until 3. I know. John, what, do you, what say you? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, August 12th, I, I wouldn't be able to attend the, the meeting. I would really like to attend the meeting if we are to continue. Um, and I'm not sure what Betty's availability is, or Danny for that matter, so uh, I would need to check. All right. Would you? Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I, I'm out of town as well oh, okay. during that period, okay. so 
Maybe that's <laughs> significant enough that we have to pick another date. Well, I, I think this is a pretty popular vacation plan. I promise you, I'm going to go to Copenhagen, and I will be looking at all of these concepts that we're talking about <laughs> in a different context and along the Baltic. So I'll be looking for everything, and I'll let you know what I really think. Don't is worry. A <laughs> I don't know. I do believe so. I think it's been mentioned. Madam Chair, um, in the spirit of trying to uh, get firm direction from the council, or from the planning commission here. Microphone. <laughs> in the spirit of trying to get uh, clear direction from the planning commission, I'd like to go back to these three questions and, if nothing else, get a straw poll vote so we know where we stand on this and before we go back to the map and discuss that. That would be very useful for, for me and for our for staff in general. So, oh, you're uh, you actually know, asking for um, action. Well, not action, action, but no, just, you know, that's fine. Uh, we, sense of yeah. the group. And, I mean, it's 2.30, sure. almost 2.30. We've got to be yep. out of here at 3. Oh, no, and we I haven't even that. begun to look at the specifics of the land use map. And I might suggest that's probably a better... Uh, that one we could continue to another meeting uh, looking at the specifics of the land use plan. Um, since we, we'll have to be out of here, of, out of the room physically at 3 o'clock, but we certainly could yet use the next 35 minutes discussing th these three items and should we say yes, we do want to look at higher density overlays within the MOTA, then begin to shift the, the remaining time onto the map. Well, I'll be truthful. I wish I had time to look at I mean, I, you know, to focus and look at the ideas that were presented today as well before I make a big uh, decision about, you know, I'd love to answer your questions, but I, you know, I would love to also focus on what public is. Well, well, and I'm not asking for decisions. I'm just asking for feedback and, you know, okay. that, no, that sure. would be really helpful. I, I, I suspect that number one, which really... Isn't, it doesn't have a great deal of change in it, but it's a different way of calculating. I, I think I certainly could support that, changing it from going by number of bedrooms to unit size. And I know Mr. White has been concerned about that for a long time. And I as well. So, so. Uh, on number one then, this will help you, John. Uh, uh, so consider changing. Uh, so that we are looking at building envelopes versus unit size. Building envelope people? Mm, no, I thought it was... Uh, or, uh, the, the way variable density, perhaps staff could restate this. Yes, restate, restate it so we can do it. Uh, the initial, and I think, uh, I don't know if it was Mr., uh, Commissioner Bartlett that first uh, pointed it out, the way it was written in the staff report was strictly looking at uh, the changes the variable density to reduce unit sizes. I added for the purposes of this discussion and the building envelopes because, in effect, that's what that would do. It would be if you had smaller unit sizes, that would also uh, mm -hmm. uh, create for the same number of units a smaller building envelope. That's not to say I'm advocating lowering the heights of the buildings, but I'm just saying that that would be the net effect of it. If you your objective is to reduce the unit size and the uh, uh, the building envelope. For some of us, that's a benefit. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. So <laughs> okay. that's why I want to make sure that that's understood, that those two are linked. But, but essentially what it is we're talking about going from counting by number of bedrooms per unit to the size of the exactly, unit. Exactly, to the size of the unit. That's the core of the question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, think that's a good, I think that's a good move. <laughs> Madam, Madam Chair and uh, staff, I would point out that many of us have been talking about this for years, so this should not be a, a surprise that we agree with that concept. We've been asking for it. But I would also uh, suggest that there was a, another option suggested, I think Joe mentioned it, and that is larger unit sizes should equal lower density allowed. And that incentivizes rather than uses the brick bat approach to d develop uh, a property with a lower, uh, with, with a smaller unit size, which we're trying to do to, to reach the design in affordability. So I think we should uh, look at that 
as well as just simply amending the variable density uh, calculation. So could you clarify for that for me? To me, that's the, the corollary of that is, yeah. you know, you get greater density with smaller units, but you get, you know, lesser density with larger units. Right. So to me, that's one and the same. I, I don't, I'm missing the difference. I guess I don't understand the question. The, the, the larger the larger the uh, units that, that a property owner chooses to build on his property would equate to a lower maximum density allowed. Right. And then that's, yeah. yeah. Right. So that's the same thing. We're saying the same thing. Bruce? Madam Chair, I, th I think the way Joanne Relitis presented it, it was use an FAR approach on residential component so the smaller the units you have the more of them you can fit within the allowable FAR and so you don't have to have set points for each size of units like we've done in the past but it's it's a variable and it gives you more of a working relationship within and I think the threshold that was important was to set a minimum density so that you don't get a few large luxury units so it'd be an FAR approach with a minimum density sort of the opposite of the way we've done it in the past where you have a maximum density and then set increments based on bedroom count. So that gives us a, a more flexible tool and I think that would be a welcome thing for for everybody actually. I think it reaches the desired goal and it keeps it simple. And it's, you know, you have FARs everywhere else in town. So. No. Uh, Charmaine and then John. Regarding the change in the, the variable density uh, standards from unit sizes to unit numbers, I think that's something that we've wanted across the board and citywide. And it's really almost a separate discussion because it's been pretty much gone over that um, that the program the way it is now doesn't work in any, to anyone's uh, to anyone's benefit. And so that's just just do that. That's. Uh, that's definitely there. And then regarding the um, scaling of FAR, it's reminded me a little bit of the cost of benefit zones that we have regarding parking, where if you're close to the right configuration of stuff, and I think Mr. Jensen said it pretty well, that the assumptions are in place that transit is good in this location, then that creates kind of zone of benefit wherein you could have a um, a slightly different FAR than what would exist outside of that. And I think that's what Mr. Andrelitis was describing, and I think that sounds like a, um, a good idea. Uh, John and then uh, Bruce. Thank you. Um, I, I agree that on this, on this first question, I can't disagree with anybody that uh, on this, we've wanted to do this for many years, so uh, let's just go and do it. Uh, we don't need to talk about it much more. Joe's and everybody else's conversation about this FAR piece works quite well. OHA uses a differential FAR approach for commercial, non-residential and residential in its, uh, uh, in its specialized community uh, village zone. So it, it's proven to work and it gives you good projects that can be built. Uh, the second uh, question here, I'm looking on my... Uh, Staff report is shrinking the mode of boundaries an appropriate means of targeting um, future residential development. My response is absolutely not. I think it's going in the wrong direction. I think it is going against the options that uh, 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 Megan Burney has talked about and Michael Chacos. I think they, those are the people who are going to be living with the decisions that we make whenever we make them. And they almost deserve honorary planning commissioner status just to get us to get our heads pointed in the right direction so we address this most important aspect of the community. So, Commissioner Joseph, could you clarify that for me then? So, what areas then would you suggest that um, would we go back to the uh, west side uh, not the whole thing. No, or down here? Some of this shrinkage is good. I think you come back off the west side uh, to that. the uh, multifamily zones here. So, you bring this from cottage over to the over the commercial area here, down the freeway, uh, to the uh, the orange-colored area over here, uh, down um, San Andres. Andres, all the way down here, all the way down to Loma Alta, loop around, cover City College, 
uh, and take it along. Pardon? Breakwater. And the breakwater, take it along Cabrillo, uh, either up, up Garden uh, to connect up with Gutierrez or all the way over to Milpas and up the mid block east side of Milpas up to Anna Pamu Street and jog over to get up to Mitchell Torina before you come back. That's going to give you the majority of the multifamily piece. Having these um, well intended higher density neighborhood blobs at this point, I think, creates more problems than it solves, I think, with a properly uh, crafted overlay zone, you can provide for the, for the higher density in the areas that the process will allow it to take place. But the Commissioner Justice, so but the where process. though? That, that's what we need to know. Well, you can, you can say the commercial areas to start. Okay, so the all the commercial areas then the would have zones a, a in, in the In the uh, moda. But I think the process, the adaptive management process, uh, will self-mitigate this and when the glass gets close to full, you can't put any more water in it, and you have to stop. So that makes um, our decision makers, including us, establish priorities, which are in the general plan, to put affordable housing as a, as a highest priority, and everything else, I think, will uh, work its way through. Uh, so let's try not to make it too complicated, but preserve the options, and that way, I think you get the most bang for the buck and it gets done sooner as opposed to later. Okay, so would, just I'm going to make sure I understand uh, first. Would you include clarify. Would you include in terms of the the glasses too full and the adaptive management of traffic? Yes. So that would be now. That would be now. According to the community, so that's that's what that's what I'm trying to understand. If if we we're going to we we're going to increase the potential across on this side of the freeway, and the glass is already full for our congested intersections, then where's then, the like, then you can't have any more admission because the way the mission uh, intersection works, it's at D or D minus. So you put it there, and if you can do projects that are so self-mitigating they don't contribute traffic, those get the green light. But if you're talking about here, if you're talking about, uh, uh, I don't know whether Milpas and 101 is still going to be problematic after the freeway and all this. We don't know, but that's where the adaptive piece comes in. You can always red flag it if you're over 0 0.77. You can always red flag it if, it if we don't have enough water. Okay, so those so, types of controls will get us there. So just to make sure I understand, what you're, uh, what you're suggesting would be the motive then would be redefined not to include any of Upper State Street. No single family zones. No, but but you would include the multifamily and commercial zones up here? You bet. Okay. So essentially then what you're saying is you would, the mode itself would essentially be all the higher density multifamily areas here, excluding the, the lower east side. And then you would look and consider at the overlays in all the commercial areas, but that would be based on a project by project and we'd have to develop that further in terms of the criteria and that sort of thing. Yeah, but that's part of the implementation piece that we're putting off till uh, phase four or whenever it is, right? But, uh, but if you could do it now, it's... But, I mean, would you be, are you advocating the higher densities in those commercial areas or keeping it all the moda at what's being proposed now? Essentially what we have is the variable density. You can, you can do higher density if it passes the litmus test of living within our resources. Okay. Okay. And, and I mean, and the other thing is you don't want to do too much high density in the core because that's the uh, El Pueblo Viejo and that's got its own issues that I know a number of members of this commission want to make sure that we preserve we don't sacrifice the community character for just for housing but I think the design process your reviews of it internally and the community's review of it externally gives you enough controls to say this is good enough to go with at this point let's try it out and manage it as we go along. So EPV would then become one of the controlling factors like the adaptive management program that would be considered and scrutinized very carefully before you allow any of the higher densities beyond the unit size variable densities that we will change. That's it. Okay. Thank you. And, and I'll add perhaps this would take pressure off of EPV in terms of, in terms of focus and, and might be a, 
maybe that's what would benefit EPV, is to look out, as John said, into a different, uh, a different configuration of the MOTA, so that so that EPV didn't receive the, you know, it, if you have, if you have this circle, this circle, this circle, this, and and you have these areas of higher density neighborhoods, then this becomes the largest target. And if we change the target somewhat and come out this way and, and have breathing room over here, then this won't be such a an area ripe for uh, uh, that kind. Maybe it, it won't happen that it needs to receive that kind of a development or it's very it's limited or it's restricted to adaptive reuse of existing buildings that sort of thing just a thought mm -hmm. madam chair the last thing is i think the mode is an attempt to uh to overcome the downside of euclidean zone zoning that's gotten us into the problem we've got with the changing uh perspective on sustainability on urban livability and and I think we're we're pretty close with our policy guidance and a map like this. Uh, I think it really, I think we want to encourage that and not restrict it. Uh, Bruce? Well, that makes it easy to follow on with John. I, I pretty much agree with his definition of the motor boundary, especially if we take out the single family neighborhoods. And I do agree that it will help take the pressure off of EPV. I think the other thing that I would not like to lose sight of, though, was the concept of dual density or if we migrate into a FAR approach would be to have a higher FAR or density for rentals as opposed to for sale units. So I think if we could <clears throat> plug that into the equation as well, I think that would be well received and certainly help for workforce and affordability uh, in this area. Perpetuity yep. uh, you know, I'd like to clarify one point both for the community and for the commission members. Uh, what, what's proposed in the Plan Santa Barbara for these single-family areas is not variable density. It's granny units, as was described, and I think that that was an important distinction that uh, Mary Louise Days made, made, that, you know, it's not a second unit, it's a granny unit, but the idea is you want to encourage those here within the motor that still have the benefit of proximity to transit, commercial, and uh, very walkable and bikeable. So I mean, I'm getting the impression that, oh, no, take the single family out because we don't want big multifamily in these single family. I couldn't agree more. But the concept is you want to look at a, all the tools we have in our toolbox to increase density uh, in a way that is consistent with the character of the community, whether it's the single family neighborhoods or in the commercial areas. So. Um, I would just like you to, to keep that in mind as we talk about uh, the MODA and the relationship to single family. Uh, uh, Sheila, and then Bendy, and then Bruce. Um, do you need your light? I saw your light again. Did you want to? I, I was just going to finish up on my comment oh, about the dual okay. density and the rental. I mean, the advantage of having that sorry, concept second. is that you then, once you develop it as rental at the higher density, you're unable to convert it then into condominiums, which has been another issue that we've all been facing. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Sheila and then Bendy. Um, <laughs> I, I guess I, I'm not clear on, on what... I think I know what the FAR is, but could you explain how 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 this would differ from what has been proposed in terms of the variable density? Well, I think the the idea of an FAR concept is you're essentially given a square footage or a volume to work with, and then you can carve up that volume into more smaller blocks or few larger blocks. But the idea with this concept was to set a minimum threshold so that we don't get large blocks filling up our overall building envelope that we're saying is our maximum. But it's not set increments like on the spreadsheet that we had in front of us for a, a two bedroom it's this and a three bedroom it's that. It's, you can work with, work with it and come up with your own pro forma. It's, it's flexible just like the economy. You can kind of adjust depending on how the market moves. But, Except, the, but the box size is set. But if, on, the, on the lot size. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Right, the FAR is based on lot size. But if we're trying to discourage big units, they could, somebody could still, using that method, they could still put in well, not, not if we have a minimum density. If we have, have a density minimum. that precludes oh. them from having a unit okay. larger than 1,300 square feet, then that, that's how we regulate that. 
Okay. Yeah. So then it's a it's sort of a hybrid combination of of controlling the size of the box and also the unit size. Right. And it, it, it allows, you know, if an owner has property that's been in the family for a long time, they want to have one owner's unit and then have all the other units small, then it still balances itself out. So. Okay. Bendy? Okay. Oh, <coughs> oh sorry, you. are you finished? Um, well, that's all right. But Bendy, no, you go ahead. Right. Thank you. Um, I've got uh, sort of a, a Jackson Pollock of uh, words to... Uh, uh, respond to all the different comments that have been made today, and so and we don't we're, we're quarter to three, so I yep. I am disappointed. We we need to have a bigger discussion uh, uh, from this point because um, we we had the questions up there. We could probably get through those, which don't even get started on the the full discussion mm -hmm. that, that is needed today, uh, coming out of today. Um, first of all, the moda. Uh, where I started, I kind of come full circle back. Uh, uh, Lee touched on a critical issue with regard to Moda, and that is MTD is suffering financially. And it's, uh, we need to, that the, the Moda to me has a definition of providing excellent transit, great transit. How much excellent transit can we provide? And how does our land use planning going forward five years, 10 years, 20 years, maybe in flusher times we're able to bring on more transit and expand the transit area. But right now, what can we do that's going to be not just the token one an hour uh, drop off at Orpit Park or, or whatever, but something that's going by every 10 minutes that's really making sense? And that's, so that's something that we need to have as part of our discussion is what is a realistic forecast for providing transit over the next five years. Um, and, and to me, that starts to define a little bit what a component of MOTA. Uh, at least that's how I've been thinking about it for, the, for however long we've been discussing MOTA, uh, a couple of years, whatever. So uh, then unit, unit size, uh, we're... we're We've all been talking around this for years, uh, you know, smaller units, and, and yet what, what we've been seeing coming in is, you know, we started by, you know, getting rid of the 2,000 square foot studios. We finally got, got those under 1,000 square feet. And it, we're, now, I would say the one good thing that, that came out of this economic study for me was that 1,500 square feet is a luxury unit. And yet, the, the, it's, this 1,500 is about as small of a unit as we've seen come in in a long time. So we've been that far off base for a long time. So that's really sad because we took part of that boom. We took six, eight years of the boom and we wasted those resources and that space uh, to actually aggravate our problem rather than improve it. So the toolbox is bigger, wider than what we've been talking about. So we can, we can uh, do the FAR that Bruce, uh, Bruce is talking about. Uh, the rental, we could even go to a, 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 the place of saying that there's rental only areas. Just to say, this is a rental housing area. That's where this, this is how, how the R3, R4 zone was created to begin with as a rental zone. So I, I don't think it should be at least forbidden as a topic. Uh, we do, rental housing is a very big deal uh, that, that's needed in this city, and we need to find ways for it to happen. Um, do the dual density, it does that, you know, do we need to bring in, uh, borrow some, some other economist's watch uh, for, uh, uh, to, to do that? Or can we figure that out ourselves? Uh, I just hope that we can figure out a bunch of this ourselves. Um, okay, and another tool is financial incentivization. That we're uh, just, I, I was disappointed, for example, that there wasn't, um, in part, a part of the inclusionary fee didn't include a fee on commercial development. It's like that was we, the first uh, inclusionary fee we had when I first came on the planning commission 14 years ago. We were just getting rid of the inclusionary fee on co uh, commercial property. Now it's gone altogether. Uh, never came back. Uh, that's uh, too bad. Um, 
as I say, I've just got a, a whole wide range of, of topics, and I don't want to overuse uh, the, the, the precious minutes that we have left here. I wanted to appreciate seeing the gentleman from Lacumba Plaza here. I hope that this city opens up a rich dialogue with that uh, owner and, uh, on a 10-year plan to come up with something fabulous on that property. It is everybody, you look at it, it's, it's one of those things that shows up on Google that, my God, this is the big, one of the biggest uh, underused resources in the region. And let's get together and see what win-win-win possibilities there are to make something wonderful and, of course, profitable for the long term. Um, I, I scratch moda out of that first uh, sentence. I just go to change the variable density. It's not in the moda. It's everywhere. Just, mm -hmm. that's, just, just get rid of it. Um, I, th I think, and again, number two, scratch the moda. Just, uh, it's the, we're, we're uh, using that FAR in the R3, R4, which, of course, has greater setbacks uh, than the commercial district. The mixed use is what kicks, uh, you know, expands the, the, the envelope. But uh, in the R3, R4, let's allow, um, again, some more uh, density uh, with smaller units. So as I said, there's more, but I know my colleagues have things to say as well, and, and uh, I think that at least we're, we've started some interesting balls rolling that I think can make a positive difference for this city for, and for this plan. And I think we can do it ourselves and neighborhood by neighborhood. Thank you. Uh, Charmaine? Uh, Madam Chair, I just want to um, revisit the uh, possibility of having another or continued meeting on this topic. Um, I think July 30th, there's no planning commission meeting. Uh, that's next Thursday. Mm -hmm. I could be no, wrong. I'm, about not, here. You're You're not, not here for that. I'm not here. Okay, so, yes. not enough people for it. Um, but to get a good discussion on item number three, I think we're going to need more time. Um, anyway, I can uh, uh, concur with um, question one. I think you've heard enough about that. Question two. Uh, I'm not so sure, you know, if we redraw the MODA map, then this question kind of goes away mm -hmm. um, because exactly. it basically organizes uh, the multifamily units into the MODA structure um, and standards. So I'm, I, I'm not so sure that, um, well, there's a little bit of it down there. Um, so question two kind of take care, takes care of itself. Um, the... Uh, if, if Commissioner Justice's redrawing of the map is adopted, I um, I think the MODA map is fine the way it is, actually. And uh, But if the sense of the commission and the staff is that it should be bigger, then that's okay. But I actually think it starts to work okay the way it is because I'd rather have it succeed than be stretched too thin and try to satisfy too many masters. My concern about enlarging the MODA area is that, as we've already discussed, we don't have robust transit that will uh, necessarily make it work. And um, unless we can find out how to create a robust transit system that would make all of this engine work, it's like building a, a great toy but no batteries. You know, it won't run. And um, so we need to find out if we've got the energy and the batteries to make the whole thing uh, work. And in addition to the robust transit system, the other uh, element that needs to be in place to make it work is public open space. As we create more uh, denser, smaller units, we start to really feel pressed for public open space. And I would include the uh, old Presidio Park as uh, definitely part of the map that needs to show where some of our public open space is. Uh, but there is a need for more of it, and our parks budget is um, under duress right now, as are so many other budgets. Um, but if we don't start finding ways to create usable public open space, then we um, we, we defeat the purpose mm -hmm. a little bit of what we could be accomplishing. Um, I absolutely support uh, any incentives or accommodations for rental properties, uh, whether it has to be at a, um, a municipal funding or some other way. We have 60% of our population rents, 
and I think that will continue to be the case. Um, many people will decide to continue to be renters in Santa Barbara and keep their jobs here rather than uh, take an hour-long commute, and it should be a desirable place to rent, and um, I don't think that we've addressed that enough. Uh, we don't have enough rental property, and we don't have an, enough um, uh, really nice rental property. And um, lastly, uh, the other element is um, uh, just a bit of discussion about whether or not the MOTA map should include the SBCC area. Um, that is one area that I do think needs to be included uh, that's not on the map right now. Uh, what's in that pocket is the train station, SBCC, um, uh, what may or may not be a La Entrada project, um, and a number of other kinds of resources that really make sense for um, for this kind of, of endeavor. And we do see uh, projects coming forward there where people are trying to make um, uh, some multi-unit buildings happen and they are um, trying to make it happen on small lots, but it's, it's still a kind of housing that can happen there. And then lastly, um, commuter management. Um, I honestly don't think that um, any of this, and I hate to be a wet blanket, but I know we spent a lot of money getting that, borrowing that person to tell us the time using our own watch. Um, and we could go back and do scenario five and scenario six, but I don't think any of these scenarios uh, really get to the heart of our matter, which is that market-driven ownership units are not going to solve our jobs housing imbalance. If we're lucky, we'll get a hundred such units. That's not going to help the 30,000 people that are driving in and out of Santa Barbara every day. And let's face it, you know, I, I hear some people say, well, we don't need those people, you know, why don't they just work in Oxnard? Well, we do need those people. We know exactly what Santa Barbara's like when they can't get to work. It's like it was when uh, the La Conchita slide and the Gaviota slide shut off the 101 for a week. You couldn't get your oil changed, the gas stations were closed, there weren't enough checkers at the stands to get you through the supermarket line. Uh, we need those people. We can't just tell them get a job in Oxnard and leave us alone. We won't survive without them. Uh, so we really need to start addressing commuter management and um, we don't have time to even begin the discussion now. Uh, and can you but just clarify what that means, by, what you mean by commuter management? Um, if people uh, are driving their cars into town, is there a way for, and other cities and city planners and experts like Mr. Jostis would have better ideas about it than I do, but is there a way for them to be able to park their car somewhere and leave it there for the rest of the day and not have to use it to do their errands and go shopping and, uh, and do the stuff that, that I'm sure people do during the work day? Um, I know so, I do. So to improve commuter alternatives or to facilitate Within the commuting. The yeah, so if someone came in and they were able to park their car in a commuter lot, and I know we have some, but then they were able to truly rely on transit or inner city car shares where they don't have to be using their car to get all around town to do errands that they have to do during the work day. Um, real options for how people can get around in the moda um, if they work in the moda but don't live in it so commuter management mm -hmm. and I, I again I'm not an expert on that but I have a sense it's possible and, um, okay get uh, it on the roster Sheila and then John and John uh, you're gonna be hitting it home for us because we've got to jump in our single car uh, in our cars and drive single people all over to City Hall next. I was just going to say housing is where the jobs sleep at night. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, I, I, I gather that, uh, as we said, that on um, two, if we change the boundaries that, of the moda, since the idea was to take the go from 22 to 18 to move it into the mm -hmm. downtown, that is no longer an it issue. We make so it moot, yes. Two goes away. Okay. Uh, number three, uh, as I said earlier, uh, or indicated earlier, that it just, it's, it's a no-win game. If we build projects with 60 market rate units in order to get 40 affordable, you know, mid-range affordable, 
those 60 market rate units are going to create another 180 jobs. Mm. Even the, remember at the work session, someone asked, did you consider the multiplier factor? And she said, no, but luxury units create lots of service jobs. Mm. It just doesn't work. We're going to have more computers rather than less. Uh, and we have got to figure out some way to find financing mechanisms. And I don't know if it's a, going to, for bonds, to the, I don't know if this is possible. Uh, to people, to the public, um, and that's that's where we've gotten the housing. We don't have any middle income, and that's that's the really tough stuff. But I'm very interested in looking at what uh, Mr. Barry has suggested, and perhaps as Mr. White suggested, staff could look at that and see okay. if that if that works, if that pencils out, and if they, if they agree. And there was somebody else that also. So spoke in support of that. We, we can certainly address that. Uh, um, so, and, so. and, and just very quickly, you know, we, we talk about, have made all kinds of efforts in terms of commuter management, and just quickly, 1980, drove alone, this is from the census, 1980, drove alone 64%, carpooled 19%. 1990, drove alone 73%, carpooled 13%. 2000, drove alone 76%, carpooled 12% constantly going in the opposite direction of all our efforts. So that's from the census. Uh, what are those statistics from? Cause the U.S. Census. I know, but for what area? Because they don't match what, what I have for Santa Barbara County. Well, I, I have that, that's U.S. And then for California, um, well, in 2005, drove alone 74%. And carpool, 12.5%. Okay, just so that you know the Santa Barbara County statistics, uh, 80, 90, and 2,000 were about the same at, at uh, 70%. So while, okay. the, okay. while the two counties to the north and south of us have all followed that trend that you indicated, okay. our county has stayed at 70%. And has the carpooling level stayed at the same? Uh, that The mode share has fluctuated. And I don't have those statistics right now, but I can provide them for you. Okay, well, that's that's good to know. But uh... So, um, it's 3 o'clock, Madam Chair. If I could just ask for one straw poll vote. Good luck. I, I, the first, well, actually, two. It's a two-parter. Double so, good luck. So, the first one would be, uh, who's, how many of the commissioners support the idea of expanding the MODA to include the area delineated by Mr. Jostice? That would be my, the, the first question. And then the second question would be, and that would basically obviate, or um, that would render moot number two here. And then the second question is, how many of those would continue, would, would, would support market-driven affordable housing uh, at some density? And I'm, sh I'm not sure that was basically what's being called into question here. Uh, is is 60 units an acre of the right density, but at a higher density than uh, what's being proposed for the variable density standard changes? So those are the two questions. Is that clear? Or? Well, actually, the first question I'd like to make is is I would like to explore expanding the moda. I won't agree to it, but I I'm not adverse to exploring the concept. Madam, Madam Chair, John. they're reducing the moda. From where it is now, we're not expanding from where, it, where it's been reduced. I mean, we're oh, expanding okay. it from where staff we're proposes to reduce oh, it. Oh, that's fine. Okay. But we're, but I would prefer to keep it where it is. If, if we have our druthers and if we we have to play hardball, I'd go down to the outline that I that I suggested. But I think we want to maximize options at this point, not, not eliminate options. Right. So you're I saying keep it like that. this, or no, re like it was before. The previous You're the bigger one. Okay, the previous one. Yeah. Mm. That seems no. to be everybody's clear no, with. No, it's not mine. So I, I would, I like what. Let's have a show. Mr. Justice had suggested, but now you're Mr. changing Justice, your mind. Would you, would you do me a favor, real quickly, and and just uh, use a marker? I have Madam one. Madam Chair. What? We're we're two minutes after three. Yep. It's like. You know, this is like Teddy Roosevelt when, you know, he had the whole western United States out there and he's drawing national forests in about 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is ridiculous. Yeah. Um, I don't you disagree. Know, you just, let's, even if it's a Wednesday, let's, let's do it. Let's have yeah. a continuous yeah. and chew on yeah. this. because Yeah, let's continue. You know, this is too important to, to make yes. a decision like wave the wand today. Yeah. That was our... Yeah. 
Okay, fair enough. Okay. Thanks for the input. Appreciate yep. it. All right, and so we will uh, adjourn for now and reconvene in our regular chambers. Thank you. Yes.